Uh, today we're going to be talking about the world wars. You'll notice I've already put up a very exciting map uh, on the, on the uh, wall. Uh, there's a story behind these maps because there are going to be others. Uh, they happen to have, there's going to be maps of Europe and between the wars and they happen to have been, uh, they happen to have cost Cato an enormous amount of money. Uh, someone convinced, and Ed is very mad about it, someone convinced Roy Childs that they were the original maps used by Hitler to invade, <laughs> to invade Russia. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Since we have them, we might as well use them. <laughs> um, my topic this morning is going to be Europe and the world uh, in the 20th century, uh, the great century of statism. And I'm going to start by discussing the First World War. The First World War, uh, historians increasingly recognize, was a watershed and the great watershed of 20th century history. What came out of the First World War was, first of all, the establishment of communism in a great power, Russia. Uh, it's extremely doubtful that Lenin and his few thousand Bolsheviks could ever have come to power in Russia except for the dislocations and chaos produced by a losing war on the part of the Tsarist government. Also out of the First World War came fascism in Italy and the uh, fascist movement throughout Europe uh, because of a vindictive peace treaty. After a uh, little more than a decade, uh, the Nazis came to power in Germany and uh, with them the uh, seeds of World War II, also to be found in the First World War. And more generally and abstractly uh, throughout the world, uh, there came uh, throughout the uh, uh, came uh, state, state planning on an unprecedented scale. Um, by 1900, we already witness the uh, twilight and decline and um, lingering death of classical liberalism in the Atlantic world. Uh, liberalism had been in decline since uh, around 1870, uh, if we take the date uh, proposed by the British legal historian Dicey. Um, by the 1890s, a British liberal politician could say, we are all socialists now. Uh, one of the things that had aided in the demise of liberalism was the rise in the 1880s of the welfare state. This was the idea of the German <laughs> statesman Otto von Bismarck. And it's interesting that people don't consider the origins of the welfare state a little more closely. Uh, Bismarck, after all, was a militarist, an authoritarian, a man who distrusted liberalism and parliamentary government, and initiated and pioneered the welfare state. Uh, it's as if um, the time had come in the history of uh, economic development where there was a possibility that the average person and the average working person could finally become independent, self-reliant, uh, the master of his own fate because of the progress of industrial capitalism. And it was at that point that Bismarck uh, reattached the masses to the state through welfare legislation and again made them reliant on the state for uh, pensions, sort of pensioners of the state, people who were going to be tied to the state through gratitude for all the uh, benefits the state gave them. You see that. It could have been a different development, but the welfare state came in there to reattach the masses of people uh, to the government in, um, in uh, gratitude uh, for these benefits. Uh, Bismarck was aided along these lines by the rise in Germany of uh, academics called socialists of the chair. That is, they weren't socialists like the Marxist socialists in the street. They were very prominent professors. As a matter of fact, they were anti-Marxist. But they did preach the kind of, of uh, socialism and pro-state ideology that George Smith was talking about last time as having been preached in the United States. The need for centralization, the need for state control in the economy. These ideas are spreading throughout the Western world. Um, and there are some significant dates in the first decade or so of the century. 
as far as the, uh, uh, the leadership of the international liberal movement goes. In 1903, Herbert Spencer dies. One of his last essays had been an attack on the imperialist British uh, effort in the Boer War. And Herbert, <coughs> Herbert Spencer says, all my life I was a British, British patriot in the sense that uh, England was the uh, home of many uh, individual liberties. It was the home of the respect for the industrious, enterprising middle class, but my British patriotism died in the imperialist Boer War. In 1906, uh, the, last great German, uh, li the last great German liberal, Eugen Richter, dies. Uh, he had voted against uh, von Tirpitz's uh, naval buildup in uh, the uh, last few years in the Reichstag. And in one of his last speeches, he says, if we let the banner of liberalism fall, we who are the last, then who will take it up again? And uh, there was to be nobody who would take it up again. And uh, what is to happen in the next decades in, uh, in Germany to Richter's beloved uh, German people uh, and by Richter's German is uh, a true tragedy. It's not anything that a, uh, that a classical liberal of the time could have imagined the decades to come in this, in this awful 20th century. In 1910, William Graham Sumner dies, and one of his last acts had been uh, a decade before to uh, attack the Spanish-American War, uh, the American annexation of the Philippines, and the war, the least known war, the war we waged for three or four years against the Philippine people. Uh, in order to subdue them to American rule. In 1912, Gustave de Molinari, uh, the great um, uh, Belgian-French uh, economist and the uh, dean of the classical liberal school of French economists in his time, dies also. Around this time, uh, one of the last liberals who's left, the Italian Pareto, <coughs> says everyone is a socialist. They're either revolutionary socialists or they're nationalist and protectionist socialists. Uh, but there's no one who believes in the free society in Europe anymore. This is the period also of the growth of imperialism. Uh, the famous uh, rebirth of imperialism <clears throat> after a kind of lull in the middle of the 19th century, actually uh, largely caused by classical liberal ideas and values. After around 1880, imperialism becomes not only a, 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 an important movement again, it becomes a frenzy, uh, especially as we approach the end of the century and the first years of the 20th century. There are a number of reasons for this, for this rebirth of imperialism. You understand what's involved, especially the scramble for Africa, as it's called. A number of reasons for this. One is that begins to drift back and then steadily, uh, uh, gradually, uh, more and more quickly towards protectionism. The era of pretty much universal free trade is a very, very short one, just about in the middle of the century. In um, 79, Bismarck in the new, uh, Bismarck in the new uh, great unified German Reich decides to go over to a protective tariff. Uh, in the years that follow, France, which was, had always been tempted uh, to do so, had been a classical uh, country of protectionism, does the same. Uh, Russia, Austria, Hungary, and um, other countries. Now, you understand that with a regime of protectionism, uh, this makes imperialism much more likely. If there's universal free trade, then it doesn't really make very much of a difference who owns a particular colony, in the sense of who has military or political sovereignty over it. If we have a regime of universal free trade, then it doesn't really make much of a difference whether Britain owns Jamaica or France owns Jamaica, or Jamaica's independent. Okay? Because the Jamaicans will buy goods uh, in the cheapest market and they will sell goods in the dearest market regardless of the nationality of the suppliers and the buyers. So the imperialist country only has the expense of keeping up the government, uh, exercising uh, political jurisdiction, having a military garrison there and so on. There is no economic advantage to any major group in the home country. With protectionism, it's different, and you can force some captive uh, area in Africa to buy from you rather than from someone else. This does help certain uh, elite groups in the home market. So with the growth of protectionism, there's a concomitant growth of 
uh, imperialism. Another element that's involved, a political element uh, of the time, is the fact that France had been defeated in the War of 1871, which led to the unification of Germany and created this great unified German Reich right in the middle of uh, Europe. <clears throat> and overseas expansion was a way for the French to uh, sort of uh, uh, reestablish their pride. Okay, they had been defeated by the Germans. They were no longer the premier nation on the continent of Europe, but after all, <clears throat> they um, had the Foreign Legion in Algeria. They had uh, uh, a navy in uh, Indochina. They were taking big chunks of Africa. <clears throat> and the French were one of the leaders of imperialism at the time. Now, as far as imperialism goes, uh, there's a famous a movement at around, uh, um, around 1900 <clears throat> that's important in the history of thought that seeks to link imperialism very closely with capitalism. Okay? Uh, this includes a uh, number of Marxist authors and also an important British so-called liberal, called himself a liberal at this time. It's an indication of how far liberalism had come. <clears throat> uh, the German uh, Hilferdink <coughs> writes a book called Finance Capital. Uh, the Polish Marxist Rosa Luxemburg, the same. The most famous is the book that Lenin himself writes in 1917, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. <clears throat> At around the same, t well, uh, around 1902, a British radical, that is not Marxist, but radical named J.A. Hobson, writes Imperialism, a study. And this is all an attempt to um, debit imperialism to the account of capitalism. And it's interesting, in the history of thought, uh, the circumstances under which this comes up. <clears throat> Joseph Schumpeter uh, was a great economist, a great social philosopher, <clears throat> wrote a book called Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy after the Second World War. He makes a very interesting statement. He's ca he says, capitalism stands trial before judges who already have the sentence of death in their pocket. And what I take that to mean, as he explains, is that regardless of the charge that's made against capitalism, the time comes when capitalism, let's say the market basically, is acquitted of that charge, a new charge will be brought up. And an indefinite number of charges until the guilty verdict is reached and the verdict of, uh, and the sentence of death is pronounced. Around 1900, it had become obvious that the Marxist predictions about the market were not coming true. Okay? It was not the case that the middle class was disappearing, the totally, total monopoly was coming into existence. It was not the case that the business cycle had reached the point of collapse of the capitalist system. Above all, it was not the case that the workers were getting poorer and poorer. That's what, they, that's what Marx and Engels had said in the 1840s. They never changed their view. But by 1900, they, you simply could not deny the evidence of your senses. The working class in uh, capitalist societies was becoming richer and richer. OK, so that's, that set of accusations and charges against capitalism has to be put aside. And uh, the revisionists, as they were called, in Germany and in other places, led by the moderate Marxist Bernstein, say, we cannot use these charges against capitalism anymore, unfortunately. All right? Right. But the sentence of death is still there. You have to have some charge to, um, uh, 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 to give the sentence, to justify the sentence. And the new charge then arose. Capitalism may not be responsible for <clears throat> the collapse of uh, the economy or uh, cartelization or um, uh, the uh, poverty of the working class, which are not real facts. But it is responsible for a new horror and evil called imperialism. So this charge of imperialism then takes the place of the older discredited charges. With always the same psychological background, which is that there's no way this defendant is going to get off the hook. <clears throat> Whatever charge we have to bring up. When I was a kid, it was the affluent society. Okay, that's before the war on poverty was discovered. <clears throat> it was uh, not only the affluent society, it was the, the, the contemptible taste of American consumers in, in preferring tail fins on their cars. 
<clears throat> this was the message of John G Kenneth Galbraith in those days. All of these awful things are supposed to prove something uh, rotten and decadent <clears throat> about capitalism. Now, according to these theorists, <clears throat> what was responsible for imperialist expansion was the need of capitalist economies to place investments overseas. Okay, the need, because of the falling rate of profit, to find areas in the third world that would bring profitable investment. So this capital flow was supposed to bring the capitalists there. Once the capitalists are there, the capitalists look around and say, it's better if our own government, our own system of laws here, will work together with the politicians and force them to take over this area. <clears throat> now, since these theories were developed, um, around 1900 and, and uh, between 1900 and 1917, let's say. Historians, that is not uh, theorists or pol polemicists like, uh, of course, Lenin, <clears throat> but actual historians have been at work on this thesis to try to test it. <clears throat> and I've uh, actually done some work. In fact, I, I teach a course on theories of imperialism. The fact of the matter is when it comes to testing this thesis by actual empirical work, the thesis collapses at every point. And I can refer you to the works of D.K. Fieldhouse, for instance, a British economist. The Theory of Capitalist Imperialism is his book. Okay, an, an older book in the 20s, Eugene Staley, uh, Imperialism and the Private Investor. And there are specific books for specific countries. As far as France goes, the French historian Brunschwig, Henri Brunschwig. Okay, and uh, a very nice little book has uh, recently been published, pu published last year by Oxford University Press that very neatly summarizes many of these issues. It's a translation uh, from uh, a German historian named Baumgart. Okay. And it's called Imperialism, a nice short uh, treatment really, <coughs> summarizing many of the findings. What, did these what conclusion did these historians come to? First of all, it is impossible, it, it's inconceivable to uh, explain the imperialism of many of the imperialist powers of the time through the need for overseas uh, capital investment because these countries were net capital uh, importers. There was no such thing as a capital glut in Russia, uh, if not the chief imperialist uh, country of the time, certainly one of the most important imperialist countries of the time. <clears throat> Russia was an enormous importer of capital, especially from Western Europe. No capital glut in uh, Japan, which had become an imperialist power. No capital glut in Italy. Italy became an imperialist power at the time. <clears throat> the Italians, uh, these things uh, have a s sort of uh, division of labor about them. The Italians uh, around 1900 specializing in the collection of deserts. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Why deserts? Well, <clears throat> they, I must, they must know it in Rome, uh, but uh, Eritrea, Somalia, and, um, and Libya. Um, there was very little uh, capital for export in Germany. Um, as a matter of fact, when the time came for the Germans to get the concession from the Ottoman government to build the um, railroad to Baghdad, okay, there wasn't enough free German capital for export available. They had to call in French capitalists also. Okay. Uh, the United States, by the way, at the time, was a net capital investor, uh, importer also, still, by 1900. Uh, then, of the countries which did export capital, where did that capital go? To these third world areas? By no means. French capital went almost exclusively <coughs> to uh, southwest and southern Europe, to the Balkans, and very largely, maybe about 40% of it, to Russia. Not to any area that they're taking over imperialistically, but to these other areas. British capital, for instance, went to the old empire, that is Canada, India, Australia, and so on, to the United States, to Argentina, but again, not to these areas which were being taken over imperialistically at the time. So there is really no connection between this alleged need to place capital and imperialist expansion. In fact, the question of imperialism at this time is much more complicated. Occasionally, it is the case that some capitalists will go to the government and say, we would like you to take over this area. We need uh, to expand in this area. This was the case, uh, for instance, uh, in connection with some German expansion in the Pacific, which was encouraged by the uh, shipping lines in Hamburg. 
But by and large, this was not an important factor in connection with the new imperialism of 1880 on. And the question really is complicated. It, uh, the factors involved vary from uh, case to case. In the case of British West Africa, uh, it is largely an attempt by the British to take over territories because the French are expanding and the French, once they take over some territory, do establish a protectionist system. The British, the British rely on free trade, but the British preemptively take over so the, they're not excluded by French protectionism. That's West Africa. When it comes to East Africa, Kenya, Uganda, and so on, the main reason is strategic, as Robinson and Gallagher show in their book uh, on um, Africa and the Victorians. Strategic, the defense of um, the Sudan, which is necessary for the defense of Egypt, which is necessary for the defense of the Suez Canal. Uh, so the defense of the Suez Canal and the routes to India. The Suez Canal itself, by the way, the British took it over uh, and occupied uh, Egypt in 1882, not primarily for economic reasons whatsoever, as Disraeli himself said, but for strategic reasons. The Suez Canal was going to be used to quickly shuttle troops between the British Army in India and the European theater whenever it was necessary. The Sepoy Mutiny had only been about oh, 15 years before. So there might be a mutiny in India, you want to shuttle troops there, or bring them to the European theater to uh, block Russia or whatever. Okay, so strategic and military reasons were involved. Uh, but um, not uh, capitalism in any form, and certainly not the free market. Certainly not free market capitalists, really, by definition. But not even state capitalists, to uh, any large extent. In this, in this period of imperialism. Um, it was the old reasons of state, as they say. Uh, military reasons, strategic reasons, reasons of prestige, reasons of loving the idea of a strong state. This is the period of public education. Uh, in every little schoolhouse in Europe, and now in America at this time, not before I learned uh, recently, you had the flag of your country. Before the end of the 19th century, the American flag was not typically displayed in public schoolhouses. <clears throat> but in every country, you have the flag of your country. You have a map of the world <clears throat> with uh, various areas of the world colored in the same color as your own country, which you know, is so beautiful it almost makes, the, it makes you want to cry. That Italy should own a million square miles of desert in the north, <laughs> a half a million square miles of desert in the east, the, t the time will come when deserts are going to be very rare and Italy will have the world <laughs> by the throat. Okay? <clears throat> so, through the public school systems, uh, which are expanding in every country, uh, through uh, conscription, which brings people into the army for a few years, indoctrinates them, this idea of the grandeur, the necessary grandeur of imperialist expansion is spread to the mass of people. Uh, it's something which uh, the people take up uh, really as actively as the politicians do. But the chief uh, pushers of the specific acts of imperialism, uh, according to the historical record, are the military leaders, uh, the uh, civilian polit uh, politicians, the special nationalist groups which are set up. In Germany, the Navy League has over a million members by the time of the First World War. These are people in every walk of life who for sentimental, emotional, nationalist reasons push the imperialism of their own country. Um, these imperialist rivalries create hostilities and antipathies among the powers, um, especially when the imperialism is something that uh, expands, occurs in Europe itself. You understand, it's not <clears throat> only overseas that you can set up colonies, okay, but uh, by expansion in Europe. And any kind of attempted expansion in Europe is infinitely more dangerous at this time than uh, in Africa or the Pacific uh, or uh, East Asia. This imperialism by 1914 has been going on for three and a half decades or more. Everybody is used to it. Uh, everybody almost endorses it. Another important thing that exists on the eve of war in 1914 and really, what uh, immediately brings about the world war is the alliance system of the European powers. The European powers have engaged in collective security now for a number of decades. <clears throat> um, Bismarck uh, is uh, 
thrown, thrown out of office by the new Kaiser, uh, Wilhelm II, in 1890. But by the time he leaves, uh, he has created a number of alliances uh, in order to preserve the status quo, which he thinks is in, uh, to the benefit of Germany. Germany has an alliance called the Triple Alliance with Austria-Hungary. I don't know if you can see this here. This is an old country that uh, is destroyed by the First World War called Austria-Hungary, uh, ruled by the Habsburgs, the Habsburg family, which is the most famous name in the history of Europe. I think that's a nice thing to have, the most famous name in the history of Europe, um, and uh, composed, composed of a number of different small nationalities. Okay, <clears throat> So Bismarck has an alliance with Austria-Hungary and with Italy also called the Triple Alliance. He has, an, uh, on the side, an alliance with Russia. The whole aim is to isolate France, to prevent the French from somehow starting up uh, trouble in order to gain back their lost provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. In 1871, when the unified Germany comes into existence, <clears throat> the uh, Germans take away from France one and a half provinces over here, called Alsace, that's a whole province with the capital of Strasbourg, <clears throat> and part of Lorraine with the town of Metz. Uh, this is uh, an intense humiliation to the French. Bismarck says, look, it'll take them a long time to forget this. In the meantime, let's make it so that they can't cause any trouble by isolating them from any, po from any possible allies. The British at this time sort of are engaged in splendid isolation, would not be uh, involved in any alliances on the continent. So Bismarck has done what he wanted to do. Uh, he has alliances with the powers over here, separately with Russia. <clears throat> England is uh, minding its own business. And France is not in a position by itself to attack Germany. Uh, once Bismarck is dismissed, things start to change very quickly. The new Kaiser and his advisors decide that the, uh, it's impossible to come to um, terms both with Austria-Hungary, they're involved in this alliance, and with Russia, they're involved in that alliance, and they choose Austria-Hungary as ultimately the more dependable uh, country, and they say, look, what, there's no chance that France is going to ally with Russia. Right? France is the only great republic in Europe. It is a democratic country. Russia is an absolutism. Uh, to give you an example of uh, how ludicrous it is in Russia at this time against the law to play the Marseillaise in public. Okay, because the Marseillaise is a revolutionary song. So there's no chance these two countries are going to ally. Okay? Uh, let's go with Austria-Hungary <coughs> and um, as the more dependable Germanic power. So in 1890, the treaty with uh, Russia is uh, permitted to lapse. Two years later, the Russians and the French sign an alliance. Uh, and very quickly, it becomes a military alliance. And Bismarck, in his last years, uh, sees the nightmare uh, be beginning to materialize what he always considered the nightmare, and that was the possibility of a two-front war. With Germany in the middle, <clears throat> on this side, the second best army in the world, and on this side, by far the largest army in the world. <clears throat> uh, this alliance uh, a system intensifies as we approach 1914. More and more, each group considers itself a uh, separate and hostile camp. Um, uh, uh, after the turn of the century, after around 1900, a very, very bright and very ambitious and very aggressive French foreign minister named Del Casse brings about an, a, a brilliant coup, and that is the, under, not the alliance, the understanding, the entente with England. Not a formal binding alliance, as the French-Russian alliance is, but an understanding that increasingly, as time goes on, brings the two countries closer and closer together and their leaders closer and closer together. Uh, this entente comes into existence in 1904. Uh, so you have Germany still with its rather weak allies uh, to the south, but France now becomes a uh, kind of hinge that has an alliance with Russia and an understanding <coughs> with England. And in 1907, the French want to bring their two friends together, and England and Russia uh, come to an agreement about all outstanding colonial problems begin to grow closer and closer together. So by 1914, what you have <coughs> is a, an alliance system 
composed of the Triple Alliance in the middle of Europe and what comes to be known as the Triple Entente, okay, with France, England, and Russia. If we had a map of the world um, and not a, simply a map of Europe, this would um, appear to you, I think, uh, much, more, uh, much more dramatically. Because what you see on a map of the world is Europe, of course, as a very small peninsula jutting out of the vast mass of Asia. Okay, and what you see is Germany as about the size of a thumb. If this were a map of the world, Germany would be the size of a thumbnail. Okay, and what does the world look like from the German point of view? Okay, one quarter of, it, one quarter of the globe is colored pink. Okay, <clears throat> that is the British Empire on which the sun never sets. It includes whole continents like Australia. Okay, <clears throat> the next largest empire, the French. Okay, and then on the eastern side of Germany, what? Russia, the Russian Empire. Stretching from the German border to the Sea of Japan, going through 11 time zones, one-sixth of the land surface of the globe. Things look uh, rather frightening from the German point of view, actually. <clears throat> this creates a, 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 tens, a tension, a suspicion in Germany that's going to be very dangerous when the uh, last days of July come about in 1914. By the way, this is something we should keep in mind. That is, what is the world, take an, to take an, uh, a similar example in our own time, what does the world look like from the Soviet point of view? If we had a map of the world. Well, the Soviet Union is in the position that the United States would be if on our northern border we had not Canada and the sweet Canadian people, but China, okay? Uh, if on our southern border we had not Mexico, but uh, the nations of NATO assembled, led by Germany. And if Cuba were not Cuba, but Japan. Okay, that is the position the Soviet Union feels itself to be in. Do you understand what I'm saying? The position we'd be in if we had China on one border, NATO led by Germany on another, and instead of this uh, little island of Cuba, Japan were there. That's the position of encirclement which the Soviet Union finds itself in. I'm not saying this justifies anything, but we ought to understand the psychology of people who are in a position to make very dangerous decisions. We would understand how things look to them from their point of view. And after 1907, the world looks like an extremely dangerous place to the Germans. Uh, there's a kind of sense of encirclement that comes about. <clears throat> Also, what's been going on also what's been going on is an armaments race. Okay, now, most of the people in this room uh, were born, I think virtually everybody was were, uh, of you were born into a world where an armaments race was a normal part of life. Right? That is, of course, every year you uh, build more and more. Uh, in the way of, um, of ships and planes and tanks and so on in order to uh, forestall some enemy. This was not the case in the 19th century, in the liberal 19th century. Uh, armaments budgets kept going down and down and down through most of the century, unless there was some war in the Orphi, some war of national unification, let's say. But with the collapse of liberalism and uh, the uh, growth of imperialism and militarism, the nations of the world begin to engage in very threatening arms races. Okay, every country wants to build a huge uh, uh, ocean-going navy, and the British <clears throat> want to maintain their standard of a navy equal to that of the next two largest navies put together. You can see that that will tend to get out of control, that sort of arms race. Conscription has been introduced into every European country except Britain, and we have mass armies uh, mass standing armies and enormous reserves of uh, trained soldiers, people who have been through uh, the uh, conscript uh, system and are ready there to be called back to the colors. Um, the armaments budgets just keep getting larger and larger. And every country thinks every other country is spending more than they are. Uh, is frightened of every new development, every new uh, uh, change in the design of a, of a rifle. Um, with these great armies uh, that are uh, there uh, standing, armies in the uh, army already or latently there. 
uh, ready to be brought into existence in a few days. In other words, as the years pass, approaching 1914, Europe is on a hair trigger. A hair trigger. Anything could start the armies moving. But nobody believes that. Because Europe has been through a number of crises and has survived them all. Okay? Uh, there are the crises over Morocco. <clears throat> Morocco is this Arab country here in northwest uh, Africa, which the French want to take over. Uh, the Germans say, look, there's not that much territory left in the world. You can't simply take it over. The French say, OK, we'll give you something. But um, conferences are necessary in 1905 and 1911. Uh, and there's uh, some chance of, it seems, some chance of going to war. But the, crisi the crises are diffused, are defused. OK, and, you, and then afterwards, everybody breathes a sigh of relief. We didn't go to war that time. It would be so crazy to go to war, so crazy to go to war. Uh, it's not likely to happen at all. Um, there's a crisis over Bosnia, OK? <clears throat> if you think Bosnia uh, sort of sounds funny, especially if I say Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, those are the sort of places that <laughs> wars start over, right? Uh, Nablus and Hebron, uh, the West Bank, uh, places that no one ever heard of, nobody, Nicaragua, places no one has ever heard of or really cared that much about. Uh, things going on there and governments involving themselves there in a way that when the time comes they cannot any longer extricate themselves. And the people back home had no idea, had no idea that the world is going to go to war uh, because of a, of a terrorist attack in Sarajevo, Bosnia. Uh, nobody in, uh, in, uh, 19, in, on January 1st, 1914 would have been able to say. But there is a, um, a crisis over Bosnia. In 1908, Austria-Hungary and Russia get together and make a secret agreement. <clears throat> Austria, which has occupied Bosnia, will now formally annex it. The Russians will tear up part of the treaty, which limits their uh, uh, exit from the Straits in Constantinople. Uh, so there'll be a, a quid pro quo. The Austrians take over Bosnia. The Russians, however, are faced by England, who says, no, no, no. Uh, we may be friendly with you, but uh, remember, this is a very touchy thing to us. You're getting into the uh, Eastern Mediterranean that way, so uh, you be good boys and adhere to the treaty. But, and the, so the Russians go to Austria and say, in that case, you can't take over Bosnia because there's no quid uh, pro quo anymore. And the Austrians say, uh, well, we're, we've taken it over, we've annexed it. Uh, the Russians say, well, give it up. And the Austrians say, go talk to Germany about this. And the Russians, which, uh, who had just gotten out of the, Japan, uh, the Japanese war, uh, and we're in bad military shape, say, I see, I see. <clears throat> um, but they promised themselves, never again, this is the last time we're going to back down. Just as in 1962, when the superior American nuclear strength forced the Russians to back down over the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the final negotiations were made between the American and Russian negotiators of the withdrawal of the Russian missiles, the dismantling of American missiles in Turkey, the Russians made it a point to express to the Americans, this is the last time. Uh, you humiliated us. You forced us to back down. We will now proceed to an enormous military buildup, which will make us the equal of you in strategic nuclear weapons. And the Russians did that through the 1960s and 1970s, as you know it. <clears throat> um, in 1911, the uh, process begins of the um, collapse of the Ottoman Empire. This is uh, known as Turkey or the Turkish Empire, but also the Ottoman Empire, after the kind of Turks who had taken it over, the Ottoman Turks. <clears throat> and they had at one time exercised rule over an enormous port of, uh, part of the Balkans, this is the Balkans area, <laughs> and also North Africa. And uh, the um, Turkish rule is falling to pieces. Uh, the Italians, at this, uh, it's at this time that the Italians take Libya, and the small states in the Balkans all get together and attack Turkey and take each some little area of Turkey um, in the Balkans. Um, and this is dangerous. Uh, any gun that's fired in anger by a government in Europe is very, very dangerous. Um, so that uh, the fact that a war is going on in the Balkans makes everybody very nervous. There's a second war when all the other small Balkan states jump on Bulgaria, whom they think um, has taken um, too much from Turkey. 
and that's already 1913. So uh, armies are fighting on European soil. Uh, in 1912, at the time of the first Balkan War, as a matter of fact, the um, uh, Austrians mobilized their forces, <coughs> thinking that Serbia, which is a protege of Russia, <coughs> was uh, getting too much territory, was going to infringe on Austrian interests, and the Russians began to counter-mobilize. Uh, cooler heads prevailed, and that was called off. But uh, the public at large is really mistaken when it thinks that these crises have been weathered, and therefore any crisis that comes about in the future. Uh, sure, uh, there's all, there are all these armaments, there's this alliance system, there's this hatred, there's this sus suspicion, but nobody is going to be crazy enough to bring about war. Um, in uh, June of 1914, the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary and his wife, uh, Franz Ferdinand, uh, Francis Ferdinand and Sophie, are assassinated by a Serb terrorist in Sarajevo. Sarajevo, uh, which, uh, by the way, the Winter Olympic Games are going to be held there next year, right? The 70th, 70th anniversary of the assassination in 1984. Assassinated by Princip a Serb student who had come from Belgrade for that purpose <clears throat> and became a national hero in Serbia when, the, uh, when uh, they learned what had happened. It was the uh, thing that ignited the First World War, the nationalism of the Serbs. <clears throat> the Serbian idea is to use this independent country of Serbia, which has its own king, to form the nucleus of a great uh, confederation and monarchy of the South Slav, of S South Slavic people. The Serbs, the Croats, and the Slovenes, okay? They said the Italians did it in the last century, the Germans did it in the last century, we're going to do it. But in order to bring about this confederation of the South Slavs, South Slav in their language is Yugoslav, in o order to bring this about, unfortunately from, their, uh, from the point of view of the European peace, one of the great powers must be destroyed. They can only do what they want by bringing about the demise of Austria-Hungary. Because Austria-Hungary being a collection of small states, if they lose the South Slavs, the Czechs are going to want to leave, the Poles are going to want to leave, the Romanians will take over this area here, and it will be the end of Austria-Hungary. <clears throat> you have then a very typical political nationalist conflict. The Serbs, in a sense, are just as justified as, any, as the Italians had been in the 19th century to create their country of the Yugoslavia. On the other hand, it requires the destruction of Austria-Hungary. And you can understand that great powers don't sit around and allow themselves to be destroyed. Uh, this, had been, this then was the culmination of much agitation and, um, and harassment of uh, Austria-Hungary by the Serbs attempting to raise up the Slavic people in the south of their, of their country. <clears throat> and Austria-Hungary says, okay, this will be it. This is it, Serbia. You've had your last chance. They give Serbia an ultimatum. <clears throat> an ultimatum is presented to Serbia, couched in terms such that the Serbs will have to reject it. It says, for instance, you will allow us to send our police into Serbia to conduct the investigation, and they will have full police powers. No sovereign state can, can permit that. The Austrians, however, felt they had to do that because they had reason to suppose that this wasn't a random terrorist attack. In fact, it was not, as we find out afterwards. The plan was uh, made up by the head of Serbian military intelligence, that is the assassination of the Archduke. <clears throat> and um, it was known, it was not endorsed or uh, planned for, but it was known to the Serbian cabinet itself, including the prime minister, who did not inform Austria that the heir to your throne is about to be blown up. Okay? In other words, uh, the, the Austrians, in a sense, were justified in saying, we're never going to come to the truth of this unless we send our own people into Serbia to have, uh, to have an investigation. Otherwise, there will be a cover-up. But the ultimatum is one that would uh, publicly humiliate Serbia as a nation. When the Russian foreign minister uh, gets a copy of it by telegraph from uh, Belgrade, he looks at it and says, c'est la guerre ou 
It is the European war. This is the war that we have feared. Um, now, the question of the responsibility for the outbreak of the First World War is one which has been discussed by many historians. There are practically libraries fill, filled with works. One of the most recent historians uh, who's uh, gotten a following is a German historian named Fritz Fischer, <clears throat> who's sort of going back on the established consensus and now maintaining that it was, in fact, Germany that was responsible primarily for the war. Now, I admire that spirit tremendously. I think all historians should look for any evidence that, co that concludes that it was their own country that was responsible for a particular war. It's a wonderful spirit. <laughs> uh, however, I think with all uh, uh, due respect, his enthusiasm has gotten away with him. Uh, what he really does establish is that once the war starts, the German government, including the German uh, chancellor, engage in imperialistic visions. They want to take over parts of Belgium, have uh, ports on the English Channel, and so on and so on. This says nothing about the outbreak of the war and the reasons for the outbreak of the war. And most of all, he only studies Germany. He only studies what's happening in Berlin and to a smaller extent in Vienna, and not what's happening in St. Petersburg and in Paris and in other capitals. Okay, so um, this question of war, this famous question of war guilt, uh, I think, is one uh, where the older consensus, um, not not the consensus of the wartime itself, but the consensus that developed after the war, after uh, 1918, is the correct one. All of the powers share responsibility for the war, and none of the powers really wanted war, uh, rather than anything else, for imperialist expansion. To the degree that they were willing to go to war, it was because they were frightened. They were frightened of um, waiting, of uh, the, other, the other one getting in first. Uh, the Germans, you understand, have a contingency plan to deal with the real world situation, which is that they're faced with two powerful armies, and they're right in the middle. In the early years of the 20th century, the head of the uh, German general staff, a man named Schlieffen, comes up with a plan for dealing with this. <clears throat> you know that um, this map here of Europe in 1914 is, constitutes a board game. Has anybody ever seen the game Diplomacy? Played Diplomacy? Okay. Right. This is <clears throat> the board and each player is a great power. Now, supposing, let me uh, present this to you as a military contingency. You are the head or, or a member of, a general of the German general staff, and you are, uh, this uh, theoretical problem is posed to you. In the event of war, simultaneously with France and Russia, how will you deploy your forces? Are there any suggestions here? Cato is always interested in people with various talents, including perhaps military talents. <laughs> okay, any suggestions? How would you deploy the German army in the event of a war with France and Russia simultaneously? Okay, who do you get rid of first? France. Why France? Stronger. Not necessarily stronger, no. Yeah? Well, you can, uh, uh, Russia can Right, there's no, there's, you don't get rid of Russia in one fell swoop, okay? As um, uh, Marshal uh, Montgomery said uh, one time, um, the first rule of warfare is, the first rule of warfare is never invade Russia. <clears throat> okay? But if you have to, don't count on a quick victory. Therefore, in order to get rid of one of their opponents, the German plan, the Schlieffen plan, was a quick march into France. <clears throat> they were not to use the route uh, of 1870, but this time, in order to maximize uh, the uh, speed, go through the, French, the, uh, the Belgian plain. Okay, the plain of North Belgium here, sweep through here, cutting off uh, Paris from the channel ports, <clears throat> uh, uh, encircle Paris and the major French forces there, and uh, force a French capitulation. Meantime, 
The Russians, they thought, would take a long, long time mobilizing through their vast empire. And a rel relatively small German force could hold them temporarily. They would meet uh, the oncoming Russian army ber between Berlin and the border and hold them um, until the, the defeat of France and then the bulk of the German army will be shuttled, taking advantage of the central position, shuttled across the great uh, German railroad system to the Eastern Front and uh, meet the Russians um, east of Berlin. Okay, this was the only way they felt that <coughs> Germany could be saved. Because what's the alternative? You divide the German army in half, half the German army is inferior to the French army, the other half, if you'd only take half the German army, is inferior to the Russian army. In 1914, the uh, French standing army was the same size as Germany's because of their three-year th three enlistment rather than two-year enlistment <coughs> and using just everybody uh, for the army. So, this is the contingency plan for the only, the Germans think, only possible salvation of the Reich. And um, the uh, Serbians very politely decline to accept the Austrian ultimatum, and Austria begins to mobilize against Serbia. Okay. <clears throat> Get rid of this particular little um, thorn in our side. <clears throat> Uh, Serbia, however, has a big friend, has a very big friend. As a Slavic power, as a Russian protege in the Balkans, it, can, it knows it can count on Russian help. And in the last few days of July, crucial decisions are being made in, Petro, in uh, St. Petersburg and in Berlin. Uh, the key decision, as far as the Russians go, is the Russian decision to order general mobilization. General mobilization. The Russians lie about this when the Germans say, uh, we have received reports of your mobilization. The Russians say, no, nothing to it. No, nothing to it. Some of the guys like to get together and sort of <coughs> <coughs> march. <coughs> <coughs> you understand why the Russian mobilization is such a threat to Germany. It makes the Schlieffen plan impossible. Because once the Russian army is mobilized on the German border, there's no way that the German army can be withdrawn for the defeat of France because the Russians will simply flow into the vacuum. Okay, the Schlieffen plan de depends on the very slow mobilization of Russian forces. So the mobilization of Russian forces begins to panic the Germans. Um, the Kaiser sends a letter to his cousin, the Tsar. They're both grandsons of uh, Queen Victoria. Uh, and he says, Nikki, Nikki, what is this? <clears throat> the, um, but, but, but uh, seriously, very uh, insightful, he says, are we going to go to war? Who knows what this war is going to lead to? Uh, who knows what will, uh, where we'll be at the end of this war? William II is going to be in exile in, Ho in Holland, his throne taken away from him. Um, Nicholas and his family are going to be slaughtered in a shed by the communists. Um, Nicholas II is a man of uh, indecision, uh, much like Louis the uh, XVI at the time of the French Revolution, convinced by the last person he talks to. He rescinds general mobilization only to order it again when the generals and admirals come back and say, please, we have to do this. This is our only hope, our only chance. <clears throat> and in Berlin, when they hear that the Russians are mobilizing, uh, the generals and admirals come to the Kaiser and say, unless we go ahead with our plan, we are no longer responsible for the security of the Reich. In the same way that the admirals and generals would come to the President of the United States at a certain point and say, the computer reading of uh, the data being fed into it indicate a 78% chance of a Soviet missile attack. And uh, this is changing moment by moment. It is now 79.2. It is an 82% uh, percent chance of a, uh, the uh, data that we see there uh, indicates a Soviet missile attack. Mr. President, we have to do something about it. And the civilian who's in charge of the American state is in the hands of the admirals and the generals. The Kaiser was in the hands of his military people. And um, a German ultimatum is sent to the French government. 
what is your attitude, uh, uh, beginning with a, a, an inquiry, what is your attitude in the event of a war between Germany and Russia? Will you guarantee to remain neutral? And if you say yes, would you kindly hand over the following French, uh, French forts to be garrisoned by the German army, including Verdun, which controls Paris? <clears throat> the French uh, say, well, I don't know, c'est pas uh, possible. <clears throat> and uh, Germany declares war on France, and a few hours later, on Russia. And the great European war has begun. Uh, there is the question of where Britain will stand in all of this. Through the Entente, the British government has b grown closer and closer to the French, although the British people don't know anything about this. For instance, in 1912, the British say, in the event of any war between uh, Germany and France, the British Navy will guard the French uh, Channel ports so that the French Navy can concentrate on the Mediterranean against Italy and Austria if they're Germany's partners. An enormous com a moral commitment, and in fact, military commitment. This is not known to the public. So the British government has a problem. France is being attacked. It may be the Schlieffen plan is going to win. The Germans will dominate the continent, or, or France will be knocked out. But, and we have a moral obligation. Uh, the French believe that we're going to come to their aid. How will we get into this war? Uh, the Germans solve their problem for them. Because the von Schlieffen plan calls for the German army to go through Belgium, which is neutral according to an old treaty signed by the major European powers. Um, in England, the Asquith government, this is the prime minister at the time, is debating whether to get into this war. And uh, there are people who are on the war side, uh, like Winston Churchill and Lloyd George. And finally, uh, led by Edward Gray, the prime minister, they decide to go to war. One of the ministers, in the Asquith cabinet is uh, old John Morley. Distinguished, revered, uh, old gentleman by this time, famous British man of letters, a classical liberal, the biographer of uh, William Gladstone and Richard Cobden, wrote a great biography of Cobden. Uh, writer of uh, biographies of Burke, the French encyclopedists, an eminent man, and he performs the last act of English liberalism. When the cabinet decides to go to war, he resigns in bitter protest. Uh, he says this war is going to be the end of the world we knew of the 19th century. And indeed, in many ways, it was. And as George Kennan, Perhaps you know, the um, eminent and respected American diplomat and historian says about the First World War. I mean, if we look back and think to ourselves that the world went to war, even if you believe what, what the, the Entente said, to stop the Kaiser from dominating Europe, and we think of what followed the Kaiser, if we could have back that world of 1918 with the Kaiser and the conservative German elite, efficient, dynamic, basically respectful of the uh, foundations of Western civilization, this dynamic and uh, conservative uh, German elite in charge of Germany. We think of what followed that, a Germany divided between the Nazis and then uh, the communists. Okay? There, there are very few people who wouldn't say, let's, get, let's have back the Kaiser. Long live the Kaiser. Okay, long live the Kaiser. You don't have to join. <clears throat> um, now, the character of this war is, uh, is, is very difficult to communicate. On the Western Front, by the way, in case you were wondering, the Schlieffen plan doesn't work. Okay, the uh, German army is stopped at the Marne, uh, and uh, that's where they stay for four years. On the Western Front, the front does not move more than uh, about 30 kilometers either way over the next four years. It is horrendous. Uh, it's, uh, what happens on the Western Front is captured to a small extent. Have you read the novel by uh, uh, Eric uh, Maria Remark, All Quiet on the Western Front? How many people have read that? Very good. If you have not, it's a very good novel and, uh, and uh, captures the experience of a German soldier. But this was the same for, for either side. 
It was tr trench warfare. Um, altogether in the war, who knows, some 10 or 12 million people died. Uh, people experienced things both in, the, uh, in combat and the people back home understanding what was happening that uh, dazed them, that stunned them. You know, it's almost as if for a few generations <clears throat> the peoples of Europe had been uh, increased sort of like a um, uh, flock of sheep by their shepherds, okay? through industrialization, through the spread of liberal ideas and institutions, uh, through the decrease of infant mortality, the raising of standards of living, the population of Europe was enormously greater than it had ever been before. And now the time came to uh, slaughter some part of the sheep for the purposes of the ones who were in control. Uh, there is no way of expressing the horror of some of the battles. At Verdun in 1916, as I say, the fortress that uh, controls the approaches to Paris, 275,000 Frenchmen died and 250,000 Germans. At uh, the Battle of the Somme, similar figures for the British and the Germans. Passchendaele, all these horrible, horrible places. Um, by, 19, by 1917, some people are beginning to say, <clears throat> this war will go on forever. People, uh, it, one sees this in their, in their diaries, record funny dreams along these lines. There is no reason for this war ever to end. The new generation will come and they'll be put into uniforms and sent into the trenches and sent into wild, massive, uh, uh, murderous attacks. It'll just go on forever. Um, and human nature began to tire there are mutinies in the uh, French army, put down brutally. At Caporetto, uh, when the Austrians and Germans attack, the Italian front collapses. <clears throat> the Italian front collapses. I didn't get any laugh that time. I'm supposed to get a laugh every time I talk about the Italian front collapsing. <laughs> it's, uh, but laughable, I mean, I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way. These people dragged out of their uh, villages and from their farms, especially from the south, the uh, Neapolitans and the Sicilians and the Calabrians, they think that people in Rome are foreigners. What are they doing up here in the north? Who are these people? Uh, and fighting for what? Um, King Umberto is not a member of my family. Okay, he has his own family. Okay. <laughs> Why are, we, uh, why are we fighting here? Okay, so the uh, Caporetto in 1917, the Italian army simply deserts. And I only learned recently from the uh, Dennis Max Smith's biography of Mussolini that in order to reestablish order, thousands of them were executed. Thousands of them were executed by the Italian army, of course. Okay, let me just mention that all of the governments involved here are um, uh, cynical to an extreme are callous to an extreme. Um, but the Italian government perhaps more than others. Because in 1914, Italy does not go to war. It waits. In 1915, the Italian politicians begin to shop around. Who will give us the best deal for entering this war? <clears throat> they say to uh, their, the countries who are supposed to be their allies, Austria and Germany, how about giving us a Trieste here, the South Tyrol? And Austria says, that's my territory. What are you talking about? Well, that's not something that we can give as part of the spoils of war. The Italians go to the British and French, and the British and French say, sure, you can have Trieste and South Tyrol. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> <clears throat> not, not only that, when the time comes and we carve up the Ottoman Empire, you'll get a nice colony over here. By the way, these are the secret treaties of 1915 where the Entente powers, in uh, the classical imperialist manner, divide up the spoils that will uh, come to them once the war is over. <clears throat> the um, uh, Russians, for instance, are to gain Constantinople and the Straits, um, which means control of the Balkans and the Eastern Mediterranean. This is the major reason to talk about uh, things snowballing and having consequences. 
When the Tsar is overthrown in 1917, a, de a moderate and democratic government comes to power, as you probably know, led by Kerensky. This government refuses the one condition that the Russian peoples demand of their new government, which is peace. Um, a friend of mine uh, happened to teach at Stanford many years ago, Stanford University. This is in the late 60s. And um, Stanford is a very fine university. My friend taught Western civilization. There happened to be, at that time, at the Hoover Institution, in residence, Alexander Kerensky. So my friend happens to be, uh, his name is Ron, happens to be somewhat uh, pushy, coming from New York and all, <coughs> gives a call, yeah, gives a call to the Hoover Institution. Kerensky says, sure, I'll come over and, and uh, address your class <laughs> of, of Stanford freshmen, addressing the, the class of Stanford freshmen on the Rus Russian Revolution. Okay, what happened? And <clears throat> my friend had uh, a lunch with him afterwards and said to him, why didn't you make peace? You were in power, why didn't you make peace? Lenin would never have gained control. And uh, Kerensky said, we could not do that. It would have been <clears throat> a betrayal of, of our valiant allies. Countries on occasion betray allies for their own interests. The reason is the, the secret treaties. They had to stay in the war in order to get what they'd been promised, which was what the Tsars had been aiming at for generations. They would control, they would not only have the Black Sea as a total uh, uh, haven and free port for the Russian Navy, they would have access to the Mediterranean. And once they got that, once the war was over, then that great imperialist expansion and victory would solidify their position with the Russian people. So for that, they remained in the war and uh, were beaten by, by Lenin. Um, so uh, to get back to the, the point I was making, um, the Italians get the best uh, deal from the Entente powers and callously and cynically uh, go to war. The war will cost 900,000 Italian dead uh, for the sake of, of um, the uh, expansion of uh, Italian political power. Um, okay, now, how does the U.S. enter this war? For a while, there had been the growth of American um, uh, meddling in other parts of the world. We went through a stage of, um, of actual territorial imperialism, of the expansion of American territory, the acquisition of colonies. This had to do with uh, the war against Spain in uh, 1898. Uh, the war against Spain is uh, one of our less uh, heroic wars. Um, the Spaniards, by the time the war was declared by Congress, the Spaniards had agreed to all American conditions for um, uh, getting out of Cuba. This fact was not communicated by President McKinley to Congress. Um, so we got into war, and from this war uh, received Puerto Rico, basically a protectorate over Cuba. Uh, the imperialists took advantage of the jingoism and nationalism of the time, finally to annex the Hawaiian Islands. And um, we became an Asian power through the annexation of the Philippines. The war to a large extent and the acquisition of the Philippines really totally are the work of an imperialist cabal, an imperialist group in Washington, led by uh, Under Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, and including uh, Brooks Adams, the famous uh, writer, Senri Senator Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts, and um, a man named Alfred Thayer Mahan, an admiral in the US Navy. Let me just quote, uh, since I can't uh, give the evidence here, from Kennan also, who, please, uh, you must understand, does, certainly doesn't believe in any kind of uh, Bilderberger conspiracy controlling American foreign policy or conspiracies at all. He's a very mainstream man as far as that goes. And he says of the taking of the Philippines in 1898, it looks very much as though in this case, the action of the United States government had been determined primarily 
on the basis of a very able, quiet intrigue by a few strategically placed persons in Washington, an intrigue which received absolution, forgiveness, and a sort of public blessing by virtue of war hysteria. Okay, I can't imagine that that's the sort of thing that you're ever taught about the Spanish-American War uh, or the acquisition of the Philippines. The, the war against the Philippines is our first war against Asians, by the way. Uh, and it is uh, waged in, uh, since it's a guerrilla war, it's a very dirty war and, ra and waged in totally racist terms. Uh, this was our first great war after the, this civil war. So it brought North and South together against um, the uh, substitute for the Indians or substitute for blacks, these Asian people. Uh, afterwards, by the way, uh, even Theodore Roosevelt regrets having taken over the Philippines. But nonetheless, we're stuck there. Philippines are right off the coast of China and uh, just uh, south of Japan. We are now an Asian power. We are the major Pacific power by far. Well, in 1912, the progressives, the Wilsonian progressives take over the White House. Wilson right away gets involved in Mexico in a, a, a really uh, um, a comic opera incident at Veracruz over uh, an insult, an alleged insult to the American flag. Uh, Wilson is, um, is certainly a very strange man. Um, um, I think very, uh, in many ways, overestimated. Um, a book on this whole issue of uh, American policy at this time, the Spanish-American War, and especially on the policy of Woodrow Wilson, a very good and readable book, came out a few years ago by an author named Walter Karp. Okay, called The Politics of War. And um, uh, he deals with this rather complex subject in a very understandable and accessible way. Something that's certainly true and, uh, and obvious is that um, uh, Wilson um, thought a lot of himself and never conceived that he could be wrong on any issue. H.L. Uh, Mencken, the uh, libertarian uh, critic and writer, said of Woodrow Wilson that his belief was that he was the obvious candidate for the first vacancy in the Trinity. <laughs> um, the son of a uh, Presbyterian minister, himself in a, in a sense a Presbyterian minister become politician, um, he was adamant, never admitting the slightest possibility of mistake. When war breaks out in 1914, uh, the American people are largely uh, well, interested, concerned, worried to an extent, but in no sense do they believe America's interests are involved here. Well, thank God for the oceans. Thank God that uh, we don't have the constant meddling in the affairs of other people. That this alliance system, because of a terrorist attack in a, con in a town, in a country no one ever heard of, everybody is now at war. The system of entangling alliances. Well, thank God we don't have anything like that. The American elite, however, uh, especially in Washington, but all across really the uh, uh, Upper Eastern Seaboard, the area of the country which in those days counted solely in terms of determining foreign policy, uh, the elite that lives uh, from Washington uh, through the corridor up to Boston, and especially centered in New York City, the American elite was totally pro-British. Uh, a few weeks after the war begins, uh, the uh, representatives of the House of Morgan of the banking house of J.P. Morgan, go to the British government and say, we want to be your supplier. Uh, among other things, we are totally on your side uh, in this uh, awful war caused by the German barbarians. So this pro-British attitude is one of the reasons that um, uh, war is finally going to come. There's a sentimental and emotional attitude on the part of the American governing elite, uh, basically themselves of British stock. Uh, naturally, America is made up of a lot of people. But uh, how shall I put it? Uh, the Irish, for instance, don't count very much uh, at this time in terms of determining American foreign policy. The, uh, the governing elite is Anglo-Saxon. Uh, there is the question of the Morgan loans and the loans of the other New York banks to the British government especially, but also to France. This establishes another tie between the two countries. And some part of public opinion, at least, is turned against the Germans by uh, a brilliantly clever use of war propaganda. <clears throat> this is the account of the Belgian atrocities, uh, so-called. As the German army sweeps into Belgium, the American press begins to be filled with 
stories of just awful things, unspeakable things that the Germans are doing. Um, crucifying and raping nuns. Um, the German national sport seems to be not uh, soccer or what they call football, but taking babies and sort of uh, throwing them on the point of bayonets. This is very strange stuff. After all, in America at this time, one knows many Germans. Right? The Germans are one of the largest ethnic groups in America. And uh, nobody ever said that uh, they were the wittiest people in the world. Uh, nobody ever said uh, that uh, German food was particularly delicate. The famous thing about German food being that you have a nice German meal, and 72 hours later, you're hungry all over again. <laughs> On the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, it's a far cry from saying that they're uh, maybe a little coarse in their sense of humor and in their choice of food to say that they do this for fun, uh, all these awful atrocities. And um, uh, really, uh, you know, when all is said and done, uh, this, it's a very unpleasant thing that happens in regard to German Americans at this time. Um, Tom Sowell, in his great book, Ethnic America, a very interesting, fascinating book about many of the major ethnic groups in America. Tells about the uh, German contributions to uh, uh, American um, culture. Uh, one interesting thing I uh, learned from Seoul is that the Germans invented the American Sunday. That is, Sunday as a day of rest. Before then, it had been the Puritan Sunday. Everybody quietly sort of mumbling passages of the Bible silently to themselves or else going to the saloon, getting drunk and, and <laughs> picking up girls afterwards. Uh, the Germans invented the American Sunday, which was a family together having fun. You go to the beer garden, not to get uh, sloppy drunk, but to be sort of mirthful, cheer up. There's the umpa band there, uh, <laughs> right? The whole family is there. The, <clears throat> there's uh, the, uh, tour, the sports Vereine, the uh, sports associations getting together and having, um, uh, having exhibits of various kind, and you have a, night, uh, a lot of fun together. The great influx of the German immigrants in the 1840s, 1850s changed this part of American culture towards this uh, more distinctively American family type Sunday. So this was not really a, a, a contemptible group which uh, came to our country. And now they, uh, their uh, cousins and, uh, and relatives in Germany are being held up as, as monsters. And when the time comes, they're going to really get it over here in America. What is the story of the Belgian atrocities? The story of the Belgian atrocities is that they were faked, they were fabricated, they were phony. Uh, the pictures were photographed in uh, particular buildings which are known in Paris. <clears throat> the uh, stage sets were designed by uh, designers for the Parisian Opera. Uh, the stories were made up out of the whole cloth and spread by British propaganda as another weapon in the war, especially in the war for the minds of the neutral countries. Uh, but this turns a good deal of public opinion against the Germans. And um, history is very unpleasantly ironical sometimes, very cruelly ironical, more than we can imagine. In 1942, in 1942, reports began to filter out of Eastern Europe about a German policy of actually gassing Jews. And the first people who heard about this said, here we go again. Here's the old story of the Belgian atrocities. <clears throat> Some other stories spread by propaganda, nothing to it, uh, so that no attempt, for instance, was made to even bomb the railroads going to Auschwitz. Okay. The people uh, felt that they had been taken in 1914. So in, 19, in, the, in the Second World War, from 1942 on, when much worse things are being done by the Germans, uh, for a long time nobody, uh, nobody uh, was willing to believe it. <clears throat> okay. I'll tell you what, I think, uh, am I not correct, uh, started at nine, didn't we? This is uh, pretty much when we have to uh, break. Um, should we um, entertain a few questions first? That's sort of a question itself. 
You follow? I mean, like, yes, no. <laughs> okay, how about some questions? Yes. Um, when you were talking earlier about imperialism, um, I, I'm not, I, I went and saw the movie Gandhi, and I would, I don't know how accurate it was, but the, um, it, it seemed that there was a lot of capitalistic interest in the way that the British ran India. Um, could you comment on whether or not that is accurate? Well, well yeah, well, whether there was or not, first of all, would not be an answer to why the world goes in for an orgy of imperialist expansion after 1880, because India was part of the old empire. Okay, so that doesn't explain why Africa is split up, uh, why um, um, uh, the South the South Pacific is filled, uh, split up, why people are now looking at the old corrupt empires like Turkey and Persia and China and eyeing them to be sl split up. You understand? That doesn't explain this new ex imperialist expansion. India, as a matter of fact, was run pretty much on a mercantilist basis. And that was with a lot of government control, a lot of government ownership, uh, and some support for Indian capitalists. That's true. That's true. Um, uh, as I say, it's a complex issue. And in different parts of the British Empire, and certainly in different parts of the empires of other countries, which makes it a lot more complicated, that you have different factors at work as to why some territory was taken over or why it was maintained. Okay. Well, the depiction in that movie was that the uh, British uh, kind of plundered, uh, really abused the Indian population. A small proportion, uh, a very small number of the British uh, from the 18th century on, when they're involving themselves in India in a big way, uh, make fortunes out of India, sure. But India, of course, is a very, very poor country. The British are making a lot more money out of America at this time. As the Americans, of course, are making out of Britain, right? It's not that the British are exploiting America, but with the trade to America, with the uh, placing of uh, investments in America, the British are making a fortune. Yes? In the light of the enormous atrocities committed by the Germans in World War II, does that give you pause and make you think maybe some of those stories from World War I were true? Could they have uh, suddenly changed there's the no, character from World There's no reason to have to speculate on this. The stories aren't true. The uh, evidence on which the stories were, were based, for instance, Lord Bryce's report, turn out to be fabrications. Lord Bryce himself virtually admitted it after the war. There is hard evidence on that. Yes. Uh -huh. There's a, a book by a man named Peterson, Propaganda for War. Okay, Propaganda for War, a classic book that came out after the First World War, and that would be an example. A book, a book by a British man, uh, Arthur Ponsonby, along the same lines. But um, um, I, ca I can't imagine what's being suggested by that, that because uh, under a uh, totalitarian, uh, insanely ra racist regime, the Germans commit atrocities of, of an, awful, on a, an awful scale. Uh, therefore, under a relatively mild authoritarian regime, uh, a monarchy, they would be committing uh, analogous at atrocities. I don't see any reason to suppose something like that. Well, that, that means that with a tremendous change in a relatively short period of time, we're talking about 20 years or 25 I can't years. imagine, I can't imagine anyone in, in America in 1914 who would have greeted uh, with joy the destruction of a Japanese city and the death of 100,000 people. You, tell, you ask anybody in America, you ask Theodore Roosevelt himself, okay, that old sissy probably would faint. Um, you ask anybody, okay, <clears throat> would you will the total annihilation of a Japanese city? What are you talking about? Are you crazy? What do you mean an annihilation of a city? What are we, uh, Tamerlane? What are we, Genghis Khan? Any other questions? Yeah. I wasn't uh, quite certain how uh, England got uh, what actually did they, because the Germans went into Belgium, then yeah. where did their troops first enter the continent? In Belgium or in France? Or the, um, literally the first troops, I'm not sure. But the British uh, took the left flank on the Western Front, and the French uh, took uh, the center and the uh, right flank. When the Americans came in, they were more on the right flank. 
Um, how they came into the war, uh, the, uh, 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 Edward Gray goes to the House of Commons and says, our honor is involved here. A small, uh, Belgium has been invaded. We are a, guarant a guarantor of Belgian neutrality. Uh, and we have to go to the defense of Belgium. Because England always goes to the defense of small countries. And somebody says, what about Ireland? And uh, <laughs> Gray says, arrest that man. <laughs> Um, there was some, but the thing about, no, but wars never really just occur like that, a country not even being invaded. England could have said, we, uh, all that the Treaty of 1839 meant is that we committed ourselves not to attack Belgium. Didn't mean that we have to go to war with any country that does, okay? What was involved was uh, a, a fear of Germany, a fear of German uh, predominance on the continent, and also something which is very hard to talk about, but which is the worst possible thing. And that is that for years, the war with Germany was considered the inevitable war. It was gonna come sooner or later. Just as from the 1920s on in the Navy Department in Washington, the war with Japan is the inevitable war. Just as, who knows, there are people in the think that the war with Russia is the inevitable war. That sense that we, there's nothing we can do about it, it's gonna come sooner or later, might as well take the best opportunity, uh, seize the best opportunity to wage the war. Kurt? Yeah, I was wondering what your comment is on Germany not wanting the U.S. to enter on the side of Britain. Um, seeing that American industrialists are using shipping a great deal of armaments, like maybe 10 million pounds of powder a day, Germany is sending saboteurs in the U.S., uh, which is the public opinion is about to be uh, you know, mobilized against Germany. Would it, would it have been smarter for Germany to adopt a different policy as far as this U.S. Uh, sabotage? Well, yeah, the sabotage never really amounted to, to very much because it was very inept. Uh, and um, uh, the great mass of uh, Germans and uh, Austrians and Hungarians and so on in America <clears throat> never had anything uh, to do with it. Um, I'll talk a little later how we, um, about how we got into the war uh, because I've sort of split it off and I haven't <coughs> talked about the problem of uh, submarine warfare. <clears throat> um, the, the Germans underestimated American power. In fact, American power decides who wins the war. Uh, not only economic power, but even the military power towards the end. Um, it's because of American involvement that the war does not turn out to be a stalemate, but uh, is decisively won by the uh, Entente powers. Uh, any other quick, quick questions? Um, yeah, Rick. Russia was, uh, Russia was partially mobilized prior to the war, and that sort of what instigated Germany's uh, declaration of war simultaneously against Russia and France. What was Russia doing? while Germany was in France. Didn't they have the power sort of to sweep across Germany? I know they're usually the Russian, <clears throat> The Russians enter into East Prussia, and the Russian army is defeated at a battle called Tannenberg. Uh, the German general, later field marshal, is named Paul, uh, Paul von Hindenburg and becomes a German national hero for having stopped the Russians at Tannenberg. OK, well, we'll take our usual break. Okay, I want to say a few words about uh, America's entry into the war. Um, the issue that was involved um, was the, um, the, uh, the rights of neutrals, and especially on the high seas. As soon as the war breaks out, both sides begin violating the traditionally understood uh, rules of naval warfare. Uh, the British, for instance, set, set up a blockade of the uh, German North Sea ports which is not legal in international law because it wasn't a close-in blockade. It was largely um, carried out by mines uh, scattered in the area. Um, it was agreed by most international uh, law experts that uh, this was an imperfect blockade. And besides, the British put on the list of contraband uh, items which had never appeared before, including food, including food. Uh, this, the uh, sending of food and even neutral ships to Germany uh, was um, uh, interdicted by the British. Uh, the Germans, uh, in response, began to uh, um, exploit their uh, weapon of uh, submarine uh, warfare, and this became a, a, a problem. 
the submarines cannot uh, really uh, obey the rules of um, the cruiser rules of warfare, which involve, uh, in the case of a merchant ship carrying co contraband, the stopping of the ship, uh, the uh, loading of the uh, passengers and crew onto your own ship, and then the sinking, if necessary, of the uh, ship carrying contraband. Submarine was simply too small to carry um, uh, passengers or even the crew of, a, uh, of, of an enemy merchant ship carrying contraband. Uh, early on, uh, just at the beginning of 1915, the Germans capture uh, British orders from the British, from the British Admiralty, which uh, instruct British merchant ships, uh, when they sight a submarine, to turn around and to ram the submarine. Uh, so that it becomes an increasingly uh, problematical for the Germans to even attempt to obey the old rules of surfacing, uh, warning the uh, uh, ship, and so on. Uh, because uh, the very act of surfacing <coughs> might bring about uh, the destruction of the submarine. Uh, in those days, the submarine was a fairly fragile thing. So many, many, uh, most really, uh, merchant ships, if they turned around and attempted to ram the submarine, uh, had a military advantage, even a, mer a merchant ship. This becomes more and more of a problem. In May of 1915, uh, the problem is uh, enormously exacerbated because the Germans sink the most famous ship in the world, uh, the Lusitania. Uh, it's a British ship, Cunard lines, but it's carrying Americans, and also not only contraband, but munitions of war. The Lusitania had violated American um, law by uh, shipping munitions outside of, uh, out of uh, New York Harbor on the way to Liverpool. Um, but in any case, the fact of the death of so many people uh, horrifies some po portion of American public opinion. The Wilson administration now uh, takes the position which will ultimately lead to war. The German government is to be held strictly accountable, strictly accountable for the death of any Americans on the high seas, regardless of circumstances. Uh, the Germans say, well, uh, let's see if we can live with this, as long as you're willing to um, put pressure on the British to have them modify their violations of international law. That is, uh, they're uh, placing a food on the list of contraband materials, which had never been done before. The British, as you know, take your merchant ships off the high seas uh, on the way to Rotterdam, because they say anything that goes to Rotterdam is gonna go to Germany. So they take American ships off the high seas. The British have put cotton, cotton on the list of contraband, confiscating these materials, uh, they interfere with letters going uh, to the continent uh, uh, because they think there's uh, military intelligence possibly involved. The British are uh, imposing in many ways on Americans. So if you hold them responsible, uh, we'll uh, behave ourselves as far as submarines uh, go. Um, this was not to be the case. And the attitude of the Americans towards uh, British violations of neutral rights were quite different. One reason is that the American ambassador to the American ambassador to London, uh, Walter Hines Page, was an extreme Anglophile. Uh, one time, for instance, he gets a message from the State Department saying, tell the British they uh, have to stop interfering with um, American mail shipments to uh, neutral ports. And uh, the American ambassador goes to the British Foreign Minister, Edward Gray, and says, look at the message I've just got from Washington. Uh, let's get together and try to answer this. Uh, this was uh, his attitude. The British were never, to hell, were never held to the same standard as the Germans. At home, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who in previous uh, years had been a great friend of uh, the Kaisers and a great um, admirer of Germany, now says we have to get into this war right away. Um, besides that, <coughs> there's a campaign for preparedness. Uh, for building up the American Army, the, the American Navy, drilling um, American uh, s citizens in, uh, in uh, combat uh, techniques. There's a kind of hysteria, really, that uh, travels over the country, uh, considering that there's, at this time, certainly, no chance, no chance of uh, some kind of immediate threat to the, Uni the United States. And people like Roosevelt and Wilson begin talking in a very um, unfortunate way. Um, Wilson says, for instance, uh, uh, in America we have too many hyphenated Americans. Uh, of course, he meant German Americans, Irish Americans. And these people are not totally loyal to our country. Uh, already scapegoats are being uh, looked for and public opinion is being uh, roused. Um, in, 19, in January, uh, this uh, ne diplomatic negotiation, uh, the, uh, the um, exchange of memos goes on for 
the next few years. In January of 1917, <clears throat> the Americans, uh, not having been able to budge the British in the least on any British violation of American rights, uh, the British blockade intensifying, the Germans really feeling hunger um, in, the, in a very literal sense, especially the people on the, on the uh, home front. <clears throat> the Kaiser is persuaded by his admirals and generals to begin unrestricted submarine warfare around the British Isles. The American position by this time had solidified, had become a totally rigid one, and when all is said and done, when you go through all of the uh, back and forth memoranda and uh, notes and uh, principles established, the United States went to war against Germany in 1917 for the right of Americans to travel in armed, belligerent merchant ships carrying munitions through war zones. Wilson's position was that even in that case, the Germans simply had no right to attack uh, the ship, as long as there are Americans on the ship. Shall I repeat that? Armed, belligerent, that is to say English, armed English merchant ships carrying munitions could not be fired upon by the Germans as long as there were American citizens on board. And it was for the right of Americans to go into the war zone on such uh, vessels that we finally went to war. Most Americans didn't see this as a burning reason for war. Uh, Sen Senator La Follette, for instance, of Wisconsin said, why don't we go to war for the right of Americans to travel on the French railroads uh, through the battle lines, okay? <laughs> <laughs> some, some American wants to get from Paris to Brussels, wants to go through, uh, <laughs> through the trenches uh, by railroad, and we'll send an American expeditionary force over there to enforce that right. Why not? Uh, finally, in April of uh, 1917, Wilson goes to Congress and, and asks for his declaration of war. Puts it in inimitable Wilsonian uh, terms. We are fighting for the right of small nations to exist. We are fighting so that liberty not uh, perish from this earth, and on and on and on and on. And America now um, assumes its uh, role as a responsible world power. Um, as um, George was explaining yesterday, the effects of this war on the home front uh, cannot be exaggerated uh, in, the t in terms of the growth of state power. Uh, this is the case in all the belligerents. Uh, in Germany, for instance, by the end of the war, the government and even the general staff has virtual total control of the German economy. The Germans call this, uh, at this time, Kriegs, um, Kriegs Sozialismus. Okay, this is war socialism, <clears throat> keeping with uh, the uh, tony quality of um, Cato presentations. There is your foreign word. For today, you take this down and, you know, use it. Um, uh, for prestige purposes. Uh, <laughs> war, war socialism, war socialism. The effective control of the German economy by the government and the German army. And by the way, that's the model that Lenin uses uh, when he takes power in Russia a few months later uh, to uh, organize the, uh, the new Soviet economy, this German model. But in every country, the state power increases enormously. In the United States, uh, the best example is the War Industries Board which uh, achieves temporary dictatorial control over the American economy in terms of prices, allocation of um, scarce supplies, and so on. The railroads are nationalized for the duration of the war. Um, and um, afterwards, uh, the government is going to give up many of these powers, but when the Depression comes, and when these older progressives and new New Dealers come to Washington in 1933, <clears throat> many of had experience during the First World War with running various parts of the American economy. The germ, the core of the New Deal was there already. Um, as far as uh, civil liberties go, the American um, uh, front uh, experiences uh, really almost, well, uh, leaving aside the incarceration of the Japanese Americans in 1942, it was worse than it was in the Second World War. A man who had gotten a million votes for uh, president in 1912, the head of the Socialist Party, Eugene Debs, is thrown into prison under the Espionage Act because uh, he says we're fighting this war on behalf of the bankers. And Wilson, uh, whom, as we all know, was a saint 
and a man of uh, total personal integrity, even after the war is over, refuses to pardon him. This is the, uh, this is the bitter and vindictive uh, nature of that man. It took Warren Harding to say, ah, come on, what difference does it make? You know, uh, get uh, Debs out of prison, this is absurd. But Wilson, until the day he got out of office, would never pardon him. Uh, there was uh, the, um, uh, the attack on the, uh, on the German Americans, uh, which has no counterpart really in the Second World War, except for the uh, uh, public evacuation of the much smaller group of, of Japanese Americans. Uh, this was uh, the sort of thing that uh, is almost uh, too silly for words, as uh, you, you may know. Um, uh, in various cities, uh, the symphony orchestras helped uh, the war effort by prohibiting the playing of any German music for the duration of the war, right? Um, the speaking of German in public was prohibited in Iowa. School systems, one after the other, valiantly threw German out of the syllabus. Um, the hamburger was uh, renamed the Salisbury Steak. <laughs> it's true. Uh, and uh, this, ki this kind of, well, you see, they had a pr the, uh, the, hy the hysteria was justified. They had a problem. This is the first time they were sending an American expeditionary force across the seas to Europe. And they didn't know, they did not know how the American people were going to react. So the people who had uh, gotten us into the war and were managing the war were rather nervous. In a way, there was a tremendous amount of overreaction involved. Well, finally, um, the war comes to an end in November of 1918. People couldn't believe it. The people who lived in the, um, in the north of France who had heard the uh, guns every moment, virtually every moment for four years, they couldn't believe that they had stopped. The Allies get together in Paris, the victors, to sign the peace treaty. Of this peace treaty, uh, the conference takes place in Paris. And for each one of the defeated nations, uh, the treaty is signed at a separate great French palace. Uh, the most important one was the treaty with Germany, signed at the Palace of Versailles. So it's called the Versailles Peace Treaty. The treaty with um, Hungary is signed at the uh, Palace of Trianon, with uh, Austria at Saint-Germain, and with Bulgaria and Turkey at other palaces. So these treaties go by these names, you see. But the most important one being with Germany, sometimes the whole settlement is called the Treaty of Versailles. This is the Europe that emerges <coughs> from the Europe that existed before the First World War. Uh, if you can see the map of the, uh, over there, the most important new difference is the coming into existence of a number of small successor states, as they're called, from Finland all the way down to Yugoslavia. Notice, by the way, that the Serb terrorists who assassinated the Archduke get what they want. They get what they want. There is this new Yugos Yugoslavia that comes into existence. Austria-Hungary is gotten rid of as uh, something obsolete, archaic. And uh, these uh, wonderful statesmen, some conservatives uh, say that it's only the government that can be far-seen. Um, does the name George Will mean anything to you, for instance? I thought you were supposed to hiss. Last time I told you, you hiss. OK, good, good, OK. Uh, he says this, but it's a conservative idea. You see, individuals are just out for their own self-interest. They're short-sighted. Only governments can uh, see in the long run. Well, OK, among other things at Paris, they destroyed Austria-Hungary and made it into an agglomeration of small states. What happens to these small states? Well, since Germany is defeated in 1918, since Russia is in a civil war, for a little time, these states manage. OK, they're able to keep their independence. Just as soon as the natural equilibrium comes about in Europe again, you have a strong Germany and a, sm a strong Russia. These states inevitably fall under the control either of Germany or of Russia. Okay? So that there's an argument to be made that uh, this old Austria-Hungary at least gave these states all put together a certain amount of clout and power in the center of Europe. But that's not to be thought of. They're done away with. <clears throat> Every territory that can be taken away from Germany is. Although President uh, Wilson announces the policy of self-determination of nations, this is not used in the case of the Germans. A big Poland comes into existence, which is just about two-thirds Polish. Uh, there are Ukrainians over here, uh, many Germans over here. And the Poles are given a corridor to the sea. 
a German city, a totally German city called Danzig, today called Gdansk, is taken away from Germany and made into a small little country of its own. The Germans say, hey, wait a minute, what's happening here? What happened to self-determination uh, self of nations? Why don't we allow the people of Danzig to say what country they want to belong to? And the Allies say, no, because Poland needs a port on the Baltic, uh, and we can't have Danzig in the hands of Germany. The Poles have to control its foreign policy there as an independent little country. <clears throat> Territory here in the, in the Silesia is given uh, to Poland. This country here, as you can see, Czechoslovakia comes into existence. Czechoslovakia, Czechs and Slovaks, six and a half, mi <clears throat> six and a half million Czechs, two and a half million Slovaks, three and a half million Germans in the Sudetenland. Okay, this territory over here, solidly German, and the Germans say, why don't we allow these Sudeten Germans to become part of Germany uh, on the principle of self-determination of nations? No, because Czechoslovakia needs a Sudeten for a superior strategic position with the Sudeten and the uh, mountains here and the Erzgebirge, okay? And if we give the Sudetenland to Germany, the Germans will be on the other side of the mountains. Strategic reasons. Uh, dictate that they be made part of Czechoslovakia. The same thing happens with the South Tyrol here, where the Italians are given German territory to take them to the Brenner Pass. Austria becomes a little rump country there, with a big bloated capital of Vienna, two, two and a half million people and about five people in the rest of the country. The Austrians say, what if we join together with Germany? Might as well now. Uh, the Habsburg days are over. The uh, treaties say there is never to be, there is never to be any association between Austria and Germany, regardless of what the, the people there want. German colonies are taken away, um, and um, the, German, the Germans are effectively disarmed. The German army is to be limited to 100,000 men. Do you know how many uh, cops it uh, takes to more or less keep um, controlled anarchy in New York City? Huh? 25,000. The whole German army is to be 100,000, which is less than the army of Lithuania. Uh, in other words, Germany is effectively disarmed. No military aircraft, no submarines, strictly limited number of surface ships. The Germans are also forced to sign Article 231 of the Treaty of Versailles, which says, we admit that we were solely responsible for this war. Unprecedented in history, where the defeated power is required to admit its guilt for having start, started the war. <clears throat> and then the question of reparations. Um, the uh, idea of reparations is accepted by the Allies. The Germans say, how much should we pay? And the French say, well, you just start sending things. <laughs> <laughs> Some people, uh, Keynes has a very good book on this, uh, The Economic Consequences of the Peace. It's one of his best books, really. Um, some people are talking in terms of $100 billion, okay? We're talking about an age when $100 billion was money, okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, finally, the um, reparations figure is put at $32 billion. But the reparations problem plagues Europe for, well, until 1933. You have the attempted uh, French hegemony over the continent here. Okay, Germany is to be kept down by the division of, the, of uh, excision of territories, by reparations, by the military restrictions on the German military forces. Beyond that, <clears throat> the French enter into alliances with the new states, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Romania. These are supposed to somehow counterbalance Germany on the east to play the role that Russia had. Russia no, no longer can play the role since it's a communist country. Um, the Ottoman Empire, by the way, is divided up. This is one of the things that uh, uh, disillusions poor President uh, Wilson, uh, who some people have suggested then at uh, the Paris Peace Conference has his usual retreat into illness, uh, getting sick and getting the flu and then finally a stroke, uh, because things are not working out the way he imagined, hardly at all. Keynes uh, says of uh, Wilson at uh, uh, the Paris Peace Conference, he reminded me of nothing so Keynes was there. He reminded me of nothing so much as a virgin in a brothel valiantly calling for lemonade. <laughs> sort of uh, out of his element somewhat, really. 
<clears throat> and then they divide, the British and French divide up uh, the Ottoman Empire. <clears throat> the French get Syria and Lebanon. The British get Iraq and Palestine. By the way, one small uh, sideline on the First World War. It was such a total war that, the, that both sides wanted to get every possible ounce of support they could. From the British point of view, it was unfortunate that many influential uh, Jewish individuals in Central Europe and Jewish firms uh, um, uh, were supporting the Central Powers, were supporting Germany. Uh, the reason for that was that they were much better treated by the Germans, and especially by Austria-Hungary, uh, than uh, Jews in Russia were, for instance. Tsarist Russia was the great anti-Semitic power. It was the Tsarist Russian uh, secret police that fabricated the famous um, protocols of the elders of Zion. Uh, famous uh, forgery attempting to prove that the Jews were trying to take over the world. Well, to counteract this, <clears throat> the British uh, Rothschild uh, addresses a letter to the British Foreign Office <clears throat> inquiring as to the British attitude on a certain question. And a member of the British Foreign Office named Arthur Balfour sends back a letter saying, it is the policy of the British government to support the creation of a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. Okay. By the way, the Balfour uh, Declaration also says, with the rights of the uh, president ha inhabitants to be respected. This is how things were done in the age of imperialism. Who owned Palestine when this British commitment was made? The Turks. Okay. So the, Brit the British were going on record as supporting the handing over a certain part of Turkish territory as a Jewish uh, national uh, um, homeland the beginning then of the uh, commitment of the British government to the uh, ideals of uh, political Zionism. And there's just no end to the problems created by that act of uh, imperialism. Um, okay, so the world then, in, uh, after 1919, when the conference takes place, seems to be pretty much under uh, British and French control. The high point of British and French imperialism is reached. The greatest extent of the British and French empires. Uh, and then they set up the League of Nations. And why was the League of Nations set up? As you know, the League of Nations was set up for all good things. There's not a good thing that the League of Nations was not set up for, <laughs> right? There's another way of looking at this, which is this. Once the uh, treaties of Paris are signed, what do we have in the world? We have established British and French world hegemony, okay? British and French control of the world with the possible assistance of the United States if the US is interested, but Germany has been demolished, Russia is in, uh, involved in turmoil, it's not gonna be a problem for a long time, and the British and French have established their, the ap have come to the apogee of their empires. And now, let us freeze that for all time. Let us up, set up an international organization with all the power of all the international community behind it, which says that any crossing of any boundary is an act of aggression, which is to be answered by the whole world community. Okay, and what have you got then? You have locked in for all time, British and French control of the world. <clears throat> That's, as I say, an alternative um, view of uh, what the League of Nations amounted to. Um, Wilson said this was the world, this was the war to make the world safe for democracy. One small point. At Paris in 1919, at the uh, conference, the Japanese delegate is there. He had been, Japan had been on the victorious side. And he says, now that the whole world community is, um, is here, why don't we take a stand? Why don't we say it is the sense of this meeting and of the powers represented here that all human races are equal and should be equal in rights? And this, is, of course, is vetoed by the British and the French. Uh, the idea of going on record for racial equality, of course not. They control hundreds and hundreds of millions of people of the darker races, <clears throat> and there's no question of the possibility of um, proclaiming racial equality there. Uh, the German delegates, by the way, unlike what happens in um, 1815 in Vienna, when, again, all the powers meet for the Congress of Vienna for European peace. Back then, uh, the French had brought in, France had been the, the uh, power that lost under Napoleon, but the new French government is brought in, takes part in the negotiations, agrees finally to the settlement, because the old philosophy had been, we had a war, sure, of course we had a war, but we still have to live in the same, on the same continent with the power that was defeated. Not in 1919. In 1919, the Germans are kept out 
Once the whole Treaty of Versailles is, is uh, arranged, uh, the German delegates are brought in, they're shown it. The Germans say, we cannot possibly accept this. The French say, don't you remember that you surrendered, that the uh, German army has been dispersed? The French army has not. Either you sign or we'll invade. And uh, the Germans reluctantly sign. Uh, when the um, uh, German leader, Erzberger, uh, goes back to uh, Berlin, he's assassinated. That is, the uh, man who signed the Treaty of Versailles, assassinated by German nationalists. <clears throat> uh, point is, German public opinion does not feel, as for instance the French did in 1815, that somehow they had lost and there was, this, was a, this was a just enough peace treaty. The Germans are uh, uh, totally um, averse to it and, and can only be uh, kept to the treaty in the next few years by force. Well, what I want to do now is get to the um, setting for New Deal foreign policy and how America uh, finally does get into the, <clears throat> uh, on, onto the world stage in a very big way indeed. The New Deal, of course, begins in 1933. That is uh, uh, the official New Deal, Roosevelt's New Deal in 1933, March, the coming to uh, Washington of uh, Roosevelt and his administration. Roosevelt's Secretary of um, State is Cordell Hull. <clears throat> Let's get rid of the old Europe. Okay. Did the, uh, Shed a the tear. Soviets Shed a tear. The Soviets just willingly uh, uh, give up that part of Russia that was part of Russia beforehand? Hardly, hardly. <clears throat> uh, um, Lenin's attitude was that um, some of the subject nationalities in, Ru in Russia should be permitted to become free. Uh, but in a number of cases, the, um, the Soviets fought bitter wars, for instance, against the Finns. And the Finns finally uh, were able to establish their uh, independence, and above all, against the, the Poles. Uh, there was a bitter war in 1919-1920 uh, between Poland and the new Soviet government. <coughs> and um, uh, finally, uh, it went back and forth. The, Russians, the Soviets had their own problems. And in uh, 1921, they decided to make the border at the armistice line. Okay, now as far as uh, um, the, uh, the New Deal and New Deal, New Deal foreign policy go, Cordell Hull goes down in the history books, you may uh, know, as being a free trader, a believer in free trade. Okay, he's a crusty old Tennessee free trader. Um, dist by the way, it's a principle. Distrust any politician who's called crusty. Okay? <laughs> I mean, that's an attempt to make them lovable. Um, the fact of the matter is, of course, that he was not a free trader in any uh, libertarian sense. Uh, he was a free trader in the sense of what could be called free trade imperialism. Uh, that is, the political and military force of the government is used in order to establish um, a, free, a free trade situation. The classic example is in regard to China and keeping the open door in China. That is, China is to be kept open to all commercial nations. It's a policy of the United States government not to permit any nation to establish control over China and to keep out the goods of other nations, okay, or to keep out the commercial transactions of other uh, nations. In order to, to uh, carry out this policy, however, naturally, you need an enormous, or you can need an enormous amount of American government, political and military force applied Okay, the, the true principle of free trade, as I understand it, and as uh, the free traders of the 19th century understand, understood it, uh, is that there is to be no government involvement of whatever kind. Um, we're not to have forced trading. For instance, uh, on the British, in, the, in the 19th century, under Palmerston, there was forced trading. The British government went to war with the empire of China to force the Chinese emperor to permit the importation of opium. Okay, and Cobden and Bright bitterly attacked that. They said, that is not free trade, to use armies and navies to force open a, uh, a market. Free trade occurs when it's voluntary on both sides and when the government keeps out of the, the matter. Uh, as Cobden wrote, affairs of trade, like matters of conscience, change their very nature if touched by violence. That's, a, that's important, isn't it? In the same way as religious faith uh, is something different if violence comes into the picture. So is trade something different as soon as violence comes into the picture. 
Um, for, as faith, if forced, would no longer be religion, but hypocrisy, so commerce becomes robbery if coerced by warlike armaments. Um, and uh, this is the ultimate problem and uh, um, uh, seed of corruption, I think, in the New Deal foreign policy, because more than ever before in American history, the full power of the American government was to be used to carve out markets for American trade in the world. Um, President Roosevelt himself, himself said in 1934, our government must continue to cooperate with our foreign traders if foreign markets are to be maintained in the face of many obstacles which have grown up in recent years against our foreign trade. And where did they imagine these obstacles uh, would be most of a problem? <clears throat> it would be in the Far East, in the Far East. Keep in mind, America was going through the worst depression in our history. And many people thought that this depression could be solved or alleviated if we had access to the markets of the Far East. Uh, this is uh, the old delusion of the China market, uh, going back deep into the 19th century, uh, that um, for all the goods America could produce, we could always sell them in China because there are so many people in China. Right? There are, all you have to do is have the Chinese buy maybe a square inch of cloth each, okay? And we would be selling them trillions of yards of cloth because there are so many Chinese, there's no end to it, okay? Or a couple of drops of oil from Standard Oil, right? Just a couple of drops of oil for the lamps of China and there'd be no problem. Uh, American industry, the oil industry and so on would be in terrific shape. The delusion, the delusion of the China trade. Even today, to this very day, the idea that somehow trade with communist China is going to be an enormous, important part of our economy in years to come. The fact of the matter, of course, is that China is enormously poor. And not only poor, but uh, more xenophobic, more uh, wary of strangers in strange ways than other countries are. The China market never materialized. But the China market uh, is the cornerstone and the, of uh, the economic uh, policy of the New Deal in the 1930s. <clears throat> it what's, it's what sets the stage with the confrontation with Japan. Uh, in 1935, Cordell Hull forwarded to Roosevelt a long State Department memo which stated, as our own population becomes more and more dense, as the struggle for existence in this country becomes more and more intense, as we feel increasingly the need of foreign markets, our definite concern for open markets will be more widely felt among our people, and our desire for an insistence upon the free opportunity to trade with the peoples of the Far East will be intensified. For in that region lie the great potential markets of the future. Okay? Uh, this is a conclusion come to by the American Secretary of State to solve our problems uh, in terms of uh, prosperity at home, the finding of uh, some markets for our factories and so on that would have to be in the Far East. Well, this created a very definite problem because Starting in the early 1930s, Japan undertakes a policy of imperialist expansion. Um, the problem uh, from the uh, Japanese point of view is this. In 1929, uh, the stock market crashes in New York. This is a kind of symbol of the onset of the Great Depression. And one thing that happens uh, throughout the world in the course of the Great Depression is that countries begin to contract themselves into their own shells. There's a, a drift towards autarky, towards protectionism, <clears throat> towards every country being self-sufficient. Uh, you, you know, under Hoover, uh, the worst uh, tariff in American history comes into existence, the Smoot-Hawley tariff. In 1932, the British Empire goes over to protectionism, Britain, which had been the home of free trade. Well, <coughs> this creates problems for every country for Japan, it posed the threat of catastrophe. The Japanese are, at this time, 70 or 80 million people living on a group of islands, which all together have, the, uh, uh, have an area about equal to that of California. Also, mostly rocky, with almost no natural resources. How is this people to survive in a protectionist world? A top-level decision is arrived at by the military and political and 
business leaders of Japan. Japan will have to carve out a market for itself. And where is this market to be found? Across the sea in China. In 1931, the Japanese invade Manchuria. <clears throat> and already, American policy sets its face against Japanese expansion. Um, a man named Henry Stimson is Secretary of State at this time under Hoover. And he wants to impose economic sanctions on Japan. Hoover, of course, as a Quaker, says, no, that's, uh, that's too much. Economic sanctions will lead to war. We'll just make it clear to them that we don't approve of what they're doing and uh, see what happens then. Nonetheless, the Japanese go ahead with the occupation of Manchuria. And as the 1930s go on, <clears throat> Manchuria itself becomes not large enough. And the Japanese think to themselves, well, what we're going to do is we're going to turn China into our India. Okay, the British imperialists have always said that India is the, uh, most, uh, is the, uh, is the, the chief gem in the, in the British imperial crown. That, it's, uh, that India has made England what it is today, uh, a world power. Well, well, we'll have our own India. Uh, there's nothing written in the stars that says that uh, the British uh, should have been the rulers of India. It happened because the British wanted to do it. Well, we'll do the same with, uh, with China. Um, and uh, where the Japanese take over in Manchuria and then after 1937 in northern, in northern China, they do establish a protectionist regime to keep out um, uh, other economic interests, and particularly the Americans. The leader of the Chinese government at this time is a dictator named Chiang Kai-shek, by the way. <clears throat> Had been a Chinese warlord and made his way to the top. <coughs> um, the the uh, 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 Japanese, by the way, their attitude is, well, of course, what, are the, what do the Americans have to complain about? They have practically a continent to themselves. Okay? They have three and a half million square miles of their own country. They have enormous natural resources. They have the greatest uh, single um, uh, free trade area in the world within the American uh, boundaries. And where the Americans do take over, for instance, in the Philippines, they set up protectionist uh, measures against other countries. Uh, look, we have to live. We have to survive. And um, there is, the, after all, the British Empire, there's the French Empire, the Dutch control Indonesia. There are vast empires in the world. Uh, Japan is a, is a poor country in the world as it is today. It has to be, uh, we have to expand or die. Um, after the war begins in Europe in 1939, <clears throat> with the uh, Hitler-Stalin Pact, the division of Poland, the German war against the, um, the Allies in the West, in 1940, the Japanese, uh, as we'll see, by September of 1940, the American policy is very clear. It's a policy that's directed against uh, Germany, that fears German expansion and also Japanese expansion. And in uh, September of 1940, the Japanese enter into an alliance with Germany and with Italy called the Tripartite Pact. And this is really very uh, bad from the Japanese point of view because what it leads Americans to think is that Japan and Germany and also Italy, are involved in some vast plan and design to divide up the world. In fact, what the tripartite uh, uh, pact said uh, was that uh, the other allies would come to the defense of the country which is attacked by the United States. Not that this was an aggressive plan. They were perfectly willing to go on doing what they were doing, Japan and China, Germany in uh, Europe, <clears throat> as long as the United States was kept out of it. But the fact that the Japanese do enter now into this formal alliance with Germany frightens the Americans and creates a great deal of distrust in the Roosevelt administration. Uh, there is no doubt that the Roosevelt administration uh, set its uh, mind against German expansion uh, from the very beginning. No doubt about that whatsoever. Um, now that the documents are out, um, and very soon after the German uh, advance in the West takes place, after, Fran after, after the fall of France in June of 1940, <clears throat> President Roosevelt in Washington, uh, he has not any of the qualms that Wilson had during the First World War. He's totally committed in his own mind. This is clear enough. <clears throat> Begins the program of uh, assistance to the enemies of uh, Germany and Japan throughout the world. 
In September of 1940, for instance, there's the destroyer's deal, whereby the United States gives 50 old destroyers. It's always said, it's always put in terms of old destroyers as if they were about to sink. Well, they were good enough for the British to want them. Uh, that is, they were seaworthy. 50 of these are given over in return for the British giving us bases um, along the North American coast, uh, Bermuda, and uh, up in Canada, and so on. This is already an act of war. Uh, according to inter international law, a neutral country simply may not give things like destroyers to a country which is at war uh, to be used against uh, its enemies. And uh, this is even more the case um, for Lend-Lease, which comes into uh, effect in, 1940, in early 1941. <clears throat> what Lend-Lease involves is, uh, the, uh, is a uh, sort of blank check uh, by Congress of X amount of money each year to the president to be used as the president sees fit in um, uh, assisting uh, nations of the world which happen to find themselves at war. Lend-Lease is used <clears throat> uh, first of all and most of all for England in its fight against Germany, then for Chiang Kai-shek against Japan, and then after June of 1941, um, Lend-Lease is given to, to Russia. Besides um, the um, uh, Lend-Lease Act of 1941, that year sees a series of accelerating acts of uh, war incidents in the North Atlantic. This is totally different from 1914. Um, Hitler had learned at least that much. The United States was not to be provoked into this war through naval incidents. Uh, in that case, then, it was the United States that would have to create the incidents. Um, there is the example, for instance, of the uh, destroyer, the USS Greer. In September of 1941, Roosevelt uh, goes on the air on the radio in those days and says to the people, I tell you the blunt fact that the German submarine involved in the incident fired first upon this American destroyer without warning and with deliberate design to sink her. The facts of the matter, as were known to Roosevelt at the time, were quite different. And um, you might look this up, for instance, in a standard reference book, which came out a few years ago, by Robert Dalek, a supporter of Roosevelt. <clears throat> professor of history at UCLA, called the Foreign Policy, Foreign Policy of Franklin D. Roosevelt. <clears throat> the facts were quite different. The Americans and British at that time were working together militarily in the, in the North Atlantic. The American um, destroyer, the Greer, spotted the German submarine and began, as per orders, broadcasting over onto the open air the location of the German sub submarine to be picked up by any British sub, um, surface ship or aircraft in the area. A British plane comes over, and together the American uh, destroyer and the British plane track the submarine for hours. Uh, depth charges are dropped by the uh, uh, British aircraft. <clears throat> After a number of hours, the uh, German um, submarine turns and fires a torpedo at the Greer, which misses. The Navy, re Navy Department report, as Dalek shows, which was already in Roosevelt's hands, said that there's no reason to uh, believe the uh, Germans were aware of the nationality of the destroyer. So what is it? It was one of Roosevelt's famous, um, what, half-truths? OK, you can find this in the uh, chapter on the road to war in Dalek's book. It was on the basis of this incident and a couple of incidents that follow later that Roosevelt declared his uh, uh, policy from September uh, 1941 on was American policy to f uh, shoot on sight any Italian or German vessels in the North Atlantic. What Roosevelt was uh, doing was looking for his incident that would force us into the war. Um, there's a debate that goes on in America at this time over whether, uh, uh, no, nobody really knows all the all facts of what is going on in Roosevelt's mind and what he is doing behind the scenes. Some suspect. The debate is, should America get into this war? On the one side are the interventionists uh, with their headquarters in the East, especially in New York. <clears throat> really, the old establishment of World War, of the days of World War I is active all over again. <clears throat> they have the, um, the uh, important papers on their side. They have Hollywood. They have the loose publications, Henry Luce, 
his publications, Time, Life, Fortune, and so on. <clears throat> the, uh, the intervention, the um, opposite camp, the non-interventionists, which, as you know, have gone down in the history books um, with the delightful name of isolationists, right? That, that sounds really nice and suggests a very open-minded person, doesn't it? <clears throat> These isolationists, otherwise known as non-interventionists, um, have their uh, base uh, in the, among uh, uh, smaller businessmen and more in the middle class than in the upper or the working class. Uh, geographically, in um, um, the uh, Midwest, headquartered intellectually at Chicago, and if you want to pinpoint it, Colonel Robert McCormick's office at the top of the Tribune Tower. Uh, but totally outclassed socially, economically, in terms of any kind of influence. They uh, lose the debate, although uh, early December of 1941, still 80% of the American people uh, favor staying out of the war. Uh, unless we are attacked. Well, we are attacked. We're attacked at Pearl Harbor. Um, Pearl Harbor is one of those cases where something happens that directs the attention of the American public to foreign policy in a way that they can't avoid thinking about it. Right? You have to admit that's a pretty spectacular and, and, and rather urgent way of forcing people to think about foreign policy, as the hostage, Iranian hostage crisis was. And in the same way, so for the first time, Americans are now paying attention to foreign policy, and they say, wow, uh, there are such crazy people in the world. Here we are, just minding our own business. <laughs> you know, we, we were on a picnic uh, when the thing happened. And I hear these crazy people uh, uh, <clears throat> want to attack us. Well, go figure human nature. Uh, Americans are the most pe peaceful, sweetest, most generous people in the world, people who love their children, um, <laughs> right? Uh, basically good guys. And here are these awful people <clears throat> now attacking us. Well, as you know, in the case of the Iranian uh, hostage crisis, there was a whole history that the American people were unaware of. For 25 years, the Americans had um, supported, uh, in every way, a government which they had imposed on the Iranians, the government of the Shah. Um, after, uh, in the 1950s, the American CIA overthrew the nationalist government of Mossadegh in Iran. Supported then the Shah's government, made him our, uh, our ally uh, in that area, uh, set up the uh, uh, Shah's uh, secret police, the Savak, uh, with the CIA um, uh, expertise, <coughs> and for some, re for some reason there were groups in Iran which held this against us. And when, they, and when they could, when they could humiliate us, when they could seize our embassy, when they could permit pictures to be taken of the American fla flag being used to uh, transport trash out to the garbage pail, they did it uh, to get back. <clears throat> the Japanese attack us in, uh, on December 7th, 1941, not because they are totally insane, uh, not because they had nothing better to do that day. <clears throat> they attack us because of what had happened in the months preceding. The Japanese, whatever you want, or might want to say about them, and during the Second World War, there was almost everything said about them. There are not too many people who are old enough to realize the, the degree of uh, race hatred that uh, was institutionalized and permitted against the Japanese in that war, much worse than against the Germans. <clears throat> the Japanese, whatever you want to say about them, are not really stupid. They don't willingly take on uh, a country as powerful as the United States. In 1941, when the United States enters the war, <clears throat> American GNP is equal to that, is equal to that of uh, Britain, Germany, Russia, and Japan put together. Japan produces 15% of the U.S. GNP, uh, GNP in 1941, and the Japanese really are not stupid. Why did they do this? They felt that the alternative was too humiliating, too humiliating. <clears throat> American policy was that the Japanese, in expanding into China, uh, and then further down into Southeast Asia, uh, trying to take over uh, Indochina from the weak French Vichy government, <clears throat> East Asian empire of theirs was going to cut America off from too much of the world market, and besides, there were being very bad people. Uh, with Cordell Hull, again, and with Stimson and Roosevelt, you have, again, that Woodrow Wilson-type hectoring, nagging, nudging-type 
of approach to foreign policy. Okay? You're very bad people. You do bad things. Uh, what do you mean being aggressive and trying to create a world empire uh, at this time in, uh, in history? Japanese say, well, we came too late, unfortunately, but that's the way it is. The British, French, and uh, others have their empires. The Americans say it's not permissible, not permissible. <clears throat> and the um, uh, situation gets worse and worse. After the tripartite pact, because the United States is very suspicious of Japan, and then as 1941 goes on. <clears throat> the immediate cause of the attack on Pearl Harbor was the freezing of Japanese assets and the subsequent petroleum embargo against Japan in the summer of 1941. As a last ditch appeal, the Japanese say, let's get together, send Prince Kanoi, the Japanese prime minister, anywhere you want, Hawaii, San Francisco, even on American soil, uh, to discuss these issues. The Americans say, well, that sounds interesting. First of all, you have to get out of China. Uh, the Japanese say, this is unheard of. The idea that the issue to be discussed will be settled beforehand. And what, what country, I mean, I'm not saying that the Japanese were justified in China, by no means, by no means. And they were particularly brutal in an awful kind of way in China. But what other, what other empire in history has ever voluntarily withdrawn from hundreds of thousands of square miles and control over tens and hundreds of millions of people? No country's ever done that. We could just as easily have demanded that the English get out of uh, India or else we would attack in, uh, England. It's simply not the way things done, uh, are done among great powers. But this American moralistic tone prevailed. The Japanese are getting more and more desperate. The oil embargo, of course, means that a time bomb is ticking away. The reserves of the Japanese Imperial Navy are being depleted day by day. The oil embargo is also one on the part of Britain and the Netherlands against Japan. You understand? Other countries don't think that the world was made so that the United States lays down the law whenever it wants. The Japanese are not going to permit their navy to be uh, stranded, to be grounded without petroleum. Before the reserves um, are uh, exhausted, they will make a move. Okay, and they do at Pearl Harbor. That uh, those battleships at Pearl Harbor Battleship Row, uh, again, great foresight on the part of a government agency, right? Do you know that the battleships were lined up one after the other? It looks nice. <laughs> <laughs> it suggests great power. It sure does. <clears throat> Those ships uh, go into history <clears throat> along with the other great mystery ships. The, uh, the USS Maine, mysteriously blown up in Havana Harbor. Um, edging the United States, giving a big push to the war against uh, Spain, or the, uh, the ships in the Gulf of Tonkin in 1964, the destroyers <clears throat> allegedly fired upon by North Vietnamese torpedo boats, uh, providing the uh, reason for the uh, Gulf of Tonkin res resolution, which was the legal base, such as it was, for the Vietnamese war. <clears throat> Other ships, the uh, Lusitania, not an American ship, but playing a role in American history. It's carrying six million rounds of am ammunition at least. What was it doing in uh, submarine infested waters out in the open that way? A target for, uh, for German submarines. Uh, the USS Liberty, the American spy ship uh, destroyed by the Israelis in 1967. What was the, the real story there? <clears throat> well, those ships in um, Pearl Harbor are another of uh, the phantom, you might say the phantom ships or the mystery ships. The reason it's a mystery only came out after the war. President Roosevelt, of course, in his inimitable way, goes to Congress and says, we were totally surprised by this dastardly attack. <clears throat> there was a uh, revisionist historian named Charles Tansel, who used to tell his classes at Georgetown. President Roosevelt went to Yalta and came back and told the American people he had made, made no concessions to Stalin. So the dying <clears throat> Roosevelt finished as he had lived with a lie on his lips. <clears throat> this is a man for whom deception was a way of life. <clears throat> this Roosevelt. Um, well, to give you an example, uh, 
from uh, the um, the author I mentioned uh, before, Dalek, talking about Roosevelt's policy in um, staging incidents in the North Atlantic and so on. In the light of the national unwillingness to face up fully to the international dangers confronting the country, you see this is an apologist for Roosevelt, in the light of the fact that the American people were not willing to face up to our dangers, it is difficult to fault Roosevelt for building a consensus by devious means. Okay, in other words, by lying about it. He told the people that we had been totally surprised at Pearl Harbor. That wasn't true. And uh, the main reason it wasn't true is that we had broken the Jap Japanese diplomatic code and we were privy to the messages sent from Tokyo, to the consulate in Honolulu, to the Japanese embassy in uh, Washington, to the uh, Japanese consulate in Hong Kong, and so on. We intercepted their messages and we could translate them and read them. You might ask yourself, what more do you have to have to be aware of an impending attack of that uh, magnitude? Do you have to be there right in the room where they're talking about it? Do you have to actually be there? The whole issue of Pearl Harbor is still one which is <clears throat> very murky, very obscure, and books keep coming out all the time. Um, a couple of years ago, two books came out, one on either side. The pro-Roosevelt one was Pranga. Pro-Roosevelt in the sense that <clears throat> the story has given out by the administration that they were totally surprised by the attack. This story is maintained. <clears throat> the opposite, that the Roosevelt administration had culpable knowledge of the impending attack is presented by the popular historian John Toland in a book called Infamy. <clears throat> there were a number of investigations and I think it is still impossible to say exactly what happened. What we do know is that uh, the messages that were deciphered and translated and known to the administration become increasingly um, fran that the Japanese messages to the uh, embassy in Washington become increasingly frantic. Um, as November goes on, uh, we know that on November 25th, Secretary of War Stimson, by the way, the man who had been Secretary of State under Hoover is now brought into the administration as Secretary of War. <clears throat> and as Tansel said, nobody ever deserved the name more. Um, Stimson, by the way, is a Republican. This is the beginning of the bipartisan foreign policy. Whatever American foreign policy is, <clears throat> uh, is supported by all good Americans, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. It's another <clears throat> part of Roosevelt's very clever um, uh, politicking in this. On November 25th, Stimson wrote in his diary about a meeting at the White House. There the president brought up the event that we were likely to be attacked, this is November 25th, perhaps as soon as next Monday. For the Japanese are notorious for making an attack without warning, and the question was what we should do. The question was how we should maneuver them into firing the first shot without, without allowing too much danger to ourselves. Um, just to give you uh, uh, an idea, on uh, December 1st, messages are interrupt, uh, intercepted. Uh, to various uh, diplomatic outposts from Tokyo, ordering them to begin burning documents and code books. Um, on um, the night on, of, De of December 6th, Saturday night, uh, this is all in the record of the uh, Pearl Harbor investigations, <coughs> um, a message is received, intercepted from, to the Japanese embassy uh, in uh, Washington saying, we will st uh, from Tokyo, we are starting to send you a 13-part message. Okay, wait until you have the whole thing, then deliver it <clears throat> to the State Department exactly at 1 p.m. tomorrow, Sunday. Okay, a messenger comes over from the dec decoding uh, agency right to the White House. President Roosevelt is, in, um, is there with his friend Harry Hopkins and looks over the message and turns to Hopkins and says, according to the, the naval officer who is the messenger, this means war. Well, this means war, and what does the American, what do the leaders of the American government do that night? Knowing that war is gonna come the next day. President Roosevelt uh, plays with his stamp collection. <clears throat> um, 
the head of naval operations, Admiral Stark, goes to the theater. The head of the army, George Marshall, doesn't know what he did that night. And it's the same all across the board. Well, you see, this is the sort of thing that keeps suspicions about Pearl Harbor alive. So this is, this is very, very strange stuff. The next morning, <clears throat> um, people are going to their offices. George Marshall goes, uh, the head of the army, goes horseback riding, by the way. Doesn't get into his office about, until about 11.30. For weeks, they have suspected that war might break out any day. Doesn't get to his office until 11.30. It occurs to him, this is, it occurs to somebody over the Navy Department, except the Navy Department, they say, we're not gonna do anything about this. That doesn't really matter, it's a coincidence. It occurs to him that one o'clock, Washington time is dawn in Hawaii. And uh, he's gonna uh, send a message to, Adam, to General Short, who's the head of the Army in the Hawaiian Islands. <clears throat> Instead of using the scrambler telephone on his desk, he sends the message by commercial telegraph by Western Union. <clears throat> the message is received uh, while uh, Pearl Harbor is burning. Now, what, was Roosevelt somehow planning to use Pearl Harbor <clears throat> as an, a way to get us into the war? I don't think there's any way of answering that definitively. But that Roosevelt, by that time, very much wanted to get us into the war, there is no doubt anymore. That old argument, did Rose, was Roosevelt sincere when he said, I'm in favor of peace, we have to stay out of this war, there's no one who wants peace more than I do. That, that argument is finished. Roosevelt lied about that, and he deceived the American people. Uh, the British documents were, um, were released. Um, one relevant document, one relevant set of documents released on January 1st, 1972, and I'm quoting from the New York Times account. War entry plans laid to Roosevelt. Britain releases her data on talks with Churchill. Formerly top secret British government papers made public today said that President Franklin D. Roosevelt told, told Prime Minister Winston Churchill in August 1941 that he was looking for an incident to justify opening hostilities against Nazi Germany. On August 19th, Churchill reported to the War Cabinet in London on other aspects of the Atlantic Charter meeting that were not made public. Quote, he, Roosevelt, was obviously determined that, we, that they should come in. If he were to put the issue of peace and war to Congress, they would debate it for months. The President had said he would wage war but not declare it, and that he would become more and more provocative. If the Germans did not like it, they could attack American forces. Everything was to be done to force an incident." End quote from the, uh, the minutes of the British cabinet. So, <clears throat> well, when people uh, say, oh, they're just a bunch of old Roosevelt haters, <clears throat> there's a, a very special reason why this man is particularly hated in American history, and it comes with the sort of unforgiving hatred that you feel for somebody who has used you and lied to you and violated you, uh, who has had you do things <clears throat> according to his will, against your own will, by manipulating and deceiving you. And that's what he did in connection with the Second World War. <clears throat> Time is uh, getting very short. I'm not, uh, we're not going to be able to get into the epic of this war in as much detail as I had thought. It is a great war. It is, as um, we are told again and again, the last good war. Good, not necessarily in terms of its consequences, which um, have brought about the destruction of any possibility of a balance of power in Europe and East Asia by the total destruction of Japanese uh, military forces. According to the Constitution we forced on the Japanese, they are not permitted to have armed forces. Okay, very typical of the mentality of the time. The idea that somehow circumstances never change. Uh, time can be frozen. Uh, the idea that perhaps the Japanese might sometime require armed forces did not occur to the American policymakers. Uh, the, German, the West Germany that exists today is one half the size of Bismarck's Reich because of the division in, with East Germany and also because all of these territories were taken away from Germany after the Second World War. Poland was moved west. That was one of the things that was done at Yalta. They decided to move Poland west. <laughs> they did that by giving these territories, this territory to Russia, and 
the uh, Poles took over East Prussia, Pomerania, and the Sudetenland, uh, and Silesia, the Silesia here. Sudetenland, uh, Czechoslovakia, they f Czechs finally solved, the Czechs finally solved the German question that had come up, that had been created with Czechoslovakia in 1919. They simply expelled three and a half million Germans. Uh, this is an aspect of the Second World War, by the way, which is not much discussed, and that is the expulsion of 17 million Germans from totally German areas in 1944 and 1945. Uh, that was um, uh, one of the uh, episodes at the end of the war. Something like two, th two and a half million Germans still unaccounted for. Clearly enough, many, many uh, of them died in the, uh, in the course of the expulsion. Well, the last good war. The problem, the main problem with this idea of the last good war is that uh, one of our allies was Joseph Stalin. <clears throat> and I wonder uh, how long people can keep com compartmentalized in their minds. On the one hand, last good war, uh, great uh, heroic alliance uh, with uh, Britain and Russia. On the other hand, another compartment of their minds, what we have learned from people like Zolzhenitsyn in his book on the Gulag Archipelago. Okay. Um, what was the nature of this regime which we Allied, with which we allied ourselves and which we supported. And by the way, here's another uh, insight on Roosevelt, also from Dalek's book. Roosevelt, after Russia is attacked by Germany in June of 1941, has to uh, convince the American people that we should send Lend-Lease to Russia. Okay, there's a good deal of anti-communism in those days, especially among American Catholics. So according to Dalek, he told a press conference on September 30th that Article 124 of the Russian Constitution guaranteed freedom of conscience. Freedom equally to use propaganda against religion, he said, which is essentially what is the rule in this country, only don't, we don't quite put it the same way. Um, Roosevelt, like uh, Wilson, was, was uh, not, a, a very, um, uh, uh, not a man with great intellectual scope. What he was trying to do in some unbelievably dumb way was convince the Americans that there was freedom of religion in Russia. Therefore, it was okay to send them Lend-Lease. And he actually said that this article of the Stalinist Constitution, which guaranteed freedom of religion, was pretty much the same as the American First Amendment. Uh, that's maybe the nadir of uh, misunderstanding. What was the nature of this regime <clears throat> uh, of Stalin's? It was uh, um, a uh, dictatorship from the moment that the uh, an authoritarian, uh, totalitarian dictatorship, from the moment that the Bolsheviks had taken over in 1917, um, the history of the Soviet secret police is so notorious that every few years they have to change their name, uh, change their initials from uh, Cheka to uh, 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 GPU to AGPU to uh, NKVD to MVD and to today the KGB. Um, Robert Conquest, the British historian, has a book called The Great Terror. And you can read it, this, of course, in Zolzhenitsyn also, the Gulag Archipelago. What was the character of this regime? This was a regime which, in um, the period of the collectivization of agriculture after 1928, <clears throat> um, caused through the uh, famines that uh, uh, came about and through actual warfare waged on the peasantry, which refused to give up the land. Uh, caused uh, an unknown number of deaths, probably in the range of four to six uh, million. Um, there came the, uh, the purge of the uh, Communist Party itself in the middle of the 1930s, uh, the great uh, show trials and the purge of the party, in which, uh, according to Conquest, there were seven million arrests, and what one out of every 10 people arrested was shot. Um, now, no libertarian uh, has anything but the deepest disgust uh, for the uh, uh, regime of filth and uh, total denigration and destruction of the human personality set up by Hitler and his Nazis. However, the analogous German purge, known as the Night of the Long Knives, which occurs in June of 1934, costs about 200 lives. And uh, what's happening behind the Iron Curtain in Russia, nobody knows about. The greatest um, number of lives, of course, were lost in connection with the gulag itself, the system of slave labor camps that Zolzhenitsyn compares to islands, strung, an archipelago strung out uh, along the 
uh, the great sea of the Soviet Union. Um, these um, concentration camps took all comers, masses and masses of people in successive waves. At first, of course, Tsarists and Mensheviks, Russian anarchists were sent to these labor camps, Orthodox priests, then the Kulaks, uh, the uh, Ukrainian peasantry and the peasantry in other parts of the Soviet Union, then the members of the Communist Party itself when it was being purged. Then when Russia starts expanding east in Europe, <clears throat> Polish prisoners of war, many of whom were murdered at Katyn Forest. Then when it takes over the Baltic states, <clears throat> the uh, Lithuanian and Estonian and Latvian middle classes <clears throat> transported en masse into the camp uh, system. Uh, then uh, German prisoners of war, Japanese, Hungarians, whoever is fighting on the Russian front. At times, when they need labor in the camps to build the Baltic White Sea Canal, they will go into movie theaters in Moscow, put on the lights, arrest everyone there, put them into trucks, and send them to the camps. <clears throat> this uh, is a system of camps all across the Soviet Union. <clears throat> Vorkuta is up here out on the Pacific in Siberia, across from Japan. There is the notorious, you might as well know the name, Kolyma. <clears throat> it is a system of camps in itself, covering an area four times the size of France, in which, according to conquest, probably around three million people died. This is the nature of our ally. And I ask you to imagine, <clears throat> as a, a hypothetical, imagine a, uh, a photograph taken in the uh, course of the Second World War. And what it shows is uh, three allies um, and friends partying, wherever. Some international meeting, heads of states, and they're partying, toasting each other. You have Franklin Roosevelt, <clears throat> and you have Winston Churchill, and you have Adolf Hitler. <clears throat> Does that sound repulsive? Well, you had exactly that photograph, except it wasn't Hitler, it was Stalin. Winston Churchill, in his endless hypocrisy, goes so far at Tehran as to give Stalin a crusader's sword a sword which had been in the possession of the British crown. Um, it seems to me, it's a very big thing to come to a conclusion about, but this puts into doubt, this at least raises the question of the moral character of this war. <clears throat> the war, of course, is even further compromised by the way it is conducted. <clears throat> in the 19th century, the classical liberals and the class atmosphere of classical liberalism led to an attempt to define rules of warfare, to put limits even on the violence of warfare. In the uh, course of the Second World War, this is given up. The only place it's not really is in the African War, which is on reason that becomes a kind of favorite war of a lot of people in North Africa, because it's a, more of a gentlemanly war. It's more of a war that, where the rules are respected. There are no rules respected <clears throat> on the Eastern Front on either side. As soon as the war breaks out in the Pacific, there are no rules of warfare respected. <clears throat> Very few prisoners taken, any uh, ship is sunk on sight. And you know uh, something of the uh, German destruction of um, civilians in Europe, especially of European Jewry. Um, but all of the states committed acts of, um, of great horror. Not only the uh, German state, not only the Russian state, <clears throat> the British state, which uh, says to itself, we cannot afford the losses uh, of uh, our troops that we suffered in the First World War. We don't have the men anymore. We will reduce Germany <clears throat> to surrender through incessant terror bombing of its cities. And about 700,000 German civilians are killed from the air. 
<clears throat> the deliberate target of British policy. That is, it was a policy of killing civilians in order to terrorize the Germans and to break their will. Uh, the classic examples of the uh, destruction of um, Hamburg in 1943, when it was discovered that uh, certain combination of certain weather conditions and uh, the intense uh, bombardment created something new called a firestorm. And then in 19, uh, February of 1945, when <clears throat> Germany was already defeated, the destruction of Dresden. <clears throat> It was the first human city that was taken out. Dresden had not been bombed in the whole course of the war because there was nothing in Dresden. I was, um, there's a good book by an uneven historian named um, um, Irving, David Irving, called The Destruction of Dresden. This is, I think, one of his better books. Um, probably around 135,000 people were killed. It was, you understand, four nights and three days of bombing. Um, and when uh, the neutral countries of Europe woke up the next day, I'm talking about in Zurich, in Stockholm, Madrid, uh, Americans had never, never heard of Dresden. Uh, why should they have? But it's as if we woke up one day and we found out that a particularly beautiful American city, let's say like San Francisco or Boston, had ceased to exist. There was a thrill of horror <clears throat> that went through Europe. The war is capped by the um, atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A, cla a now classic book on the subject is by the historian Martin Sherwin, also in paperback, A World Destroyed. Okay, and the reasons for the bombing and the reasons why the bombings were not really necessary. Uh, you know, it's an endless uh, argument one way or the other, but um, it's uh, clear, I think, enough that the Japanese uh, would have surrendered, not unconditionally, as, been as had been demanded. They wanted certain conditions. One condition is that they didn't want the emperor to be put on trial as a war criminal and hanged in front of his palace. Before, they ha before that would happen, yes, the Japanese race would commit suicide. But that they were open to negotiations and uh, certain conditions is clear. By the way, it's now that the Americans are beginning to go a little wacky with their air power, a little wacky. Um, you know that um, after the bombing of uh, Hir uh, Hiroshima, the Japanese are given two days. So it takes time to uh, bring a war machine to a halt. And then Nagasaki is destroyed. I don't want to be too uh, pathetic about it, but, if, um, but Nagasaki is the, in opera, the home of Chocho-san in um, Madame Butterfly. And that's where she waits for her American officer to appear from over the horizon. <clears throat> and then uh, Truman said, enough. OK, you know, leave it. Uh, let's at least give that crusty, beloved old Truman that much um, <clears throat> enough. He had, of course, destroyed two Japanese cities rather than negotiate. Uh, the American Air Force general in the Pacific on the spot at Tinian, Curtis LeMay, wanted to use a third bomb. Can anyone guess what city he wanted to have as the target for the third atomic bomb? Tokyo. Right. <clears throat> I'm saying there's something happening now with, this, the, with the American military, which uh, I'm not a communist. OK, I've never been a communist. <laughs> Closest I ever came to being a communist, I was a Republican. <laughs> But our leaders and our military leaders are really to be judged on the, on the same basis as others. This has come out in Fred Kaplan's new book, The Wizards of Armageddon. <clears throat> I think, uh, uh, according to the notes, he must have gotten it from Robert McNamara himself. When McNamara becomes Secretary of Defense in 1961 under the Kennedy administration, naturally he says, OK, let me show, uh, show me all the plans you have. The SAC, that's Str Strategic Air Command uh, General, Tom Power, the head of SAC, shows him the contingency plans in the event of war with Russia and China. China is still an ally of Russia at this time. McNamara is aghast. They call for the death in the first few days of 285 million Russians and Chinese through massive, indiscriminate nuclear bombing of Eurasia and 
they call for the obliteration of Albania. <laughs> there, is a, there happens to be a radar defense installation there. And the SAC general says to McNamara, and this really annoys McNamara with a sort of smirk, I hope you don't have any friends or relations in Albania because we're going to have to wipe it out. I tell you this in all honesty. Something like that, that those contingency, contingency plans would have not necessarily deterred, but they would have embarrassed Hitler and Himmler. Um, well, there's many other things we could talk about. Let me just say this. Why, are we <clears throat> uh, why do we have this emphasis, or at least in these few uh, lectures, on war and America's wars in the 20th century? Because, the reason is this, because the fact of the matter is nothing has increased the power of the American state through its history, and especially in the 20th century, as warfare. Okay, let me quote from a very good book called The Governmental Habit by Professor Jonathan Hughes, Jonathan Hughes of Northwestern. National emergency became the catch-all justification for extension of federal power into the private economy. This is a pattern in American history, he says. The heady experience of the war power was diluted by the willingness to tolerate a residual of expanded power in Washington. <clears throat> that is, once the war is over, the uh, euphoria um, uh, dissipates, but it doesn't totally dis dissipate. Some residual of that power that was accumulated remains. The legitimacy of federal control becomes an accepted part of economic life. What was once considered an extraordinary imposition of federal power, say, automatic payroll deduction of the income tax, now becomes normal. He also shows that in every American war, especially in the 20th century, <clears throat> there is enormous jump in governmental expenditures. Once the war is over, that retracts, but it never retracts to what it was before. After Vietnam, it didn't even retract at all. Bruce Porter, um, in an article in the uh, Public Interest a number of years ago, does the same kind of analysis for the number of government functionaries and employees. With every war, increases enormously. The end of the war never goes back to what, what it was before. Retracts somewhat, and you have that added accumulation because of the war. Um, so that the growth of federal power and the go growth of government power in general has been linked with warfare. The, uh, uh, creation of an, uh, intelligence surveillance bureaucracies uh, whose abuses are well known is something totally connected with warfare. And finally, what I want to say is that uh, sort of uh, tying up with my uh, previous talk on classical liberalism to an extent, what I think the experience of warfare in the 20th century shows is that the founding fathers were right. The kind of limited government republic that they were setting up here where the emphasis was on the individual, his rights, and the pursuit of happiness, is incompatible with uh, empire and with unceasing war and preparation for war. That's why Jefferson and uh, Washington warned us against entangling alliances, uh, warned us against the lure of honor and glory in a military sense. Uh, we've gone that road against uh, the, their advice and against the tradition of over a hundred years. What we have now is totally, was totally predictable. An empire spans the globe, an executive of uh, unbelievable power as against even the other branches of government, <clears throat> uh, public debt of what is it now, 1.2 trillion dollars? It'll be two trillion dollars a public debt uh, by the time Reagan leaves office. Um, the government everywhere, people accustomed to the government being everywhere, uh, a republic really quite different from the one that was envisaged, en envisioned at the beginning. Um, and also, we have a world where the single most important question is nuclear war. Uh, this, I think, is the reason why here at Cato we emphasize to an extent foreign policy. Uh, because, uh, believe me, the nuclear war is a problem uh, so great that it even dwarfs uh, questions of uh, how high the Dow will go or at what price you should start buying gold again. Um, and um, I uh, hope I've uh, cast some light on uh, some of these questions. Thank you.
two thirty. Will that give us a chance to have lunch? I think so. I mean twelve thirty, not two thirty. Um, yes. Yeah, I just want to ask you that Lemay that you mentioned, the one that the third bomb, was he the one that was the running mate of George Wallace? Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wallace was a political charter. The only other one who would uh, accept the vice presidential nomination under him was that Birmingham police force. I'm not sure if this is correct, but if the, if the proper position for, uh, for us to take would be to perhaps withdraw forces uh, from around the world and, and put ourselves in a position to defend only ourselves and not have entangling alliances, what would be the, uh, what would be do you think would be the proper position um, in the event that uh, we're doing free trade with another country and there is investment in that country uh, by um, Americans mm -hmm. um, in free trade and someone takes it, expropriates uh, what they have over there? Well, what the, your classic position was, even of imperialist governments until late in the 19th century, and even of the American government, and that is, Whoever invests overseas invests at his own risk. Okay, what is the difference then between that position um, and the and the position if, uh, of uh, of investing on the East Coast versus the West Coast? I mean, what separates? What makes in the in a libertarian point yeah. of view? You, now you're isolating us to strictly American. Uh -huh. And um, what 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 is the philosophical difference between that? and saying, well, you invested on the West Coast and they took it away from you, and that's not uh, a good reason for uh, violently taking it back. Um, that's, I don't, I don't really know what you mean. It's, the federal government is not going to be required to uh, uh, somehow assure investments against uh, expropriation in New York State. That's done by the, the laws of the state of New York. So the, the, that problem doesn't mean what East Coast and West Coast of the U.S., right? Sure. There's no need for the federal government to go in and uh, tell New York and threaten New York State uh, against expropriating uh, uh, some American company. That doesn't uh, really arise. But the real problem is that uh, once this principle of guaranteeing American property throughout the world, or whatever property, uh, is put into effect, it's uh, a recipe for endless American involvement. And uh, historically speaking, it's a very good uh, um, reason to expect that some kind of military action is going to have to be taken. Um, this doesn't mean that there's not going to be foreign investment. The opposite. Some Marxist regimes, of course, are going to uh, confiscate property. But uh, you can see what's happening in many parts of the world. Uh, developing countries in order to uh, attract property, uh, for instance, uh, Sri Lanka or Ceylon is the latest example, uh, make every effort to reassure investors. Okay? And investors will invest there in the business point. Uh, most often they'll invest where the, the uh, legal system is assured there wouldn't have to be any reason to, to send the uh, American uh, forces to defend them, like Canada, uh, Japan, uh, Western Europe, and so on. See, I, I, I think that if the Rockefellers want to invest in South America, they should not use the uh, U.S. Marines as their private uh, Pinkerton guards. Let them take the risks. Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, we should maintain the embassies during times of peace. Now, you know, I don't even think from the government's point of view embassies are necessary in the present electronic age. And Ron Paul, I believe, uh, the uh, congressman from, non-interventionist congressman from Texas has made this point. Electronically, uh, with uh, the technology and so on, you don't have to have an entourage of uh, 100 people there sort of having lunch together all the time. <laughs> it can be done uh, much more efficiently than that. Why did people say he suggested Roosevelt had intended after the war to an alliance with the Soviet Union to support wars of national liberation around the world? Do you share that opinion with Roosevelt? Well, I don't know. Um, um, Senator Rand, I'll have to chat with him about that. Roosevelt's policy was anti-colonial in that he wanted as much as possible in the future to have England and France divested of their empires precisely so they would also have open door policies towards American uh, manufactured goods and American industry. 
he was very close to uh, Churchill. And as a matter of fact, his own, as far as the atom bomb goes, his policy, as, as uh, Sherwin points out, his policy was that England was to be brought in as a full partner, not the Soviet Union. And England and the United States could use the bomb then to set up some kind of uh, 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 Anglo-American uh, uh, peace, uh, order of peace throughout the world. Uh, he didn't understand the uh, full power of the bomb. It was towards uh, the very end of his life and so on. But uh, it was really more of an alliance with England uh, to keep the peace than with the Soviet Union. And not the UN, by the way. The UN was going to be uh, simply another tool in the hands of the uh, superpowers to order the whole world. This was not a Wilsonian who believed in some kind of world uh, community of nations and democracy within those nations. Uh, well, um, can you describe any, uh, any evidence from uh, our recent history that would indicate that a libertarian attempt to set up a limited government would in fact succeed and stay limited? Would, would succeed in what? And stay limited. I mean, the, the, one of the problems it seems to be that, well, one attempt was made to set up a limited government and it eventually escalated. Mm -hmm. Probably, probably, I guess, due to ignorance of what would happen. Uh -huh. it, it, is there evidence that, that you can cite that would indicate maybe we've learned from that experience? Well, the experience is still going on, isn't it? Mm. That is, uh, this uh, involvement in uh, world affairs in a political and military sense continues to aid the growth of the American government. Um, an interesting fact is that Casper Weinberger's five-year defense budget, by the way, you know they changed the name of the Department of War to the Department of Defense, just around the time Orwell was writing, 1984. Mm -hmm. um, five-year budget of the Defense Department <clears throat> is equal to the assets of all companies whose stocks are traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So this is a rather large uh, accumulation of uh, power in only one branch of the government, the uh, uh, Pentagon. Now, whether people have learned from this experience and there's a uh, revulsion against it. No, the experience is still going on. If there's a revulsion against it, it's happening among us and among a few other people. Yes? The uh, comment about the Coolidge administration, what, uh, what was their Well, uh, Coolidge is noted uh, in diplomatic history for practicing dollar diplomacy and the use of uh, limited American uh, um, military forces to uh, keep South American, uh, <coughs> Central American and Caribbean countries in line. It's around this time, for instance, that uh, Nicaragua is occupied by the American Marines. The Americans forgot that, the Nicaraguans didn't. Yes? Uh, a good uh, section of American political thought, I would say, what we would call the, the leftists or the left wing of the Democratic Party share uh, revulsion for uh, large military budgets and so forth, but they are out and out statists. Now, how do they come to arrive at this you know, same, uh, the same end? Sort of They're not, uh, none of those people are in principle um, against uh, uh, foreign commitments or American entanglements almost anywhere in the world. Um, what's involved there is a uh, a uh, technical debate over particular weapon systems very often. And uh, these liberal Democrats at least uh, have enough sanity to think that there's $5 billion worth of waste in a $280 billion Defense Department budget. Right? The Reagan administration's position is there is not a single penny that can be spared. They present a budget that the generals and admirals want for $280 billion, and you can't take a dime away from that without endangering American security. So the, the Democrats want to pair that a little bit, get rid of particular uh, weapon systems, but nothing like the kind of radical rethinking of American foreign policy that libertarians believe in, I think. Uh, so that of all the uh, defense analysts on, on that uh, the various uh, sides use, uh, the only one I think that is, uh, has really thought these things out uh, is a libertarian uh, defense analyst, uh, namely uh, Earl Rabinow. It uh, was really thought out uh, ways of uh, saving substantial amounts of money by 
changing American policy and not simply getting rid of one weapon system or another. And I would strongly recommend his works to you. You're probably familiar with them to an extent anyway. Right? Walter Elby uh, speaking to you as well. Oh, well, maybe one more question. Yeah. I think we're all uh, free trade advocates here, but something that puzzles me, do you think that free trade and armaments would be consistent with that? You mean by private firms? If El Salvador can pay for it, should they be able to arm themselves to the teeth by the war manufacturing United States? You know, really, what's the alternative? Because there's certainly going to be groups in the world where we would say they should be able to get arms to help themselves, right? I mean, I take it no one here would particularly want to have an embargo on arms uh, to the Afghan uh, uh, Mujahideen, the freedom fighters, right? So that it seems to me the only principle that can be accept, uh, accepted is yeah. uh, there's no reason to suppose the American government can select the good and the bad guys uh, in the world. Uh, certainly been wrong in the past. Uh, so that uh, I see no alternative really to an open arms market. But the, uh, uh, the arms market would be a much, much smaller one than exists now, because now it's, uh, the credits uh, come from the uh, enormous uh, resources of the U.S. government. Uh, I really think we're uh, cut through.